Good morning, everybody. It is 10, 15 a.m. on a Friday morning, this February 8th, in the 9th. year of our Lord, 2024, February 9th. <laughs> we are here to talk about the Gypsy Rose case, all about everything that's going on. There is a small contingent of folks that have doubted her account of things. We're going to talk about why that is. We're going to talk about, in detail, the timeline from the date of her birth to the time she just got released on parole from December 28th. We're going to talk about her accounts of the murder of her mother, Dee Dee Blanchard. We're going to talk in depth about where she, what she's going through now, what she went through in the past, prospects for the future. Is there, is there prospects for a civil lawsuit against the doctors who failed to diagnose her as a Munchausen by proxy person? We're going to talk about all of that coming up next. Let's get started. Whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be, this is Omar Serrato with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm going to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney and it's after hours. So have a seat. Feel free to have a drink and join me. Let's get started. Rose. So last week I gave an introductory uh, show on my candid thoughts about Gypsy and I was without Ileana because of her sick child that she had to care for and tend to and that's just the nature of newborns mm -hmm. and she was keeping her daughter safe and happy and we talked about Gypsy and what I had discussed on the show last week was that my thoughts were not yet fully formed about how I felt about all of the parties involved in this case. I talked about how I sympathized somewhat with her boyfriend, Nicholas Godijan, and how it felt to me listening to the prison interviews and his account of things that he was severely manipulated by a vastly superior manipulator in Gypsy Rose, who was trained by the best, her mother, Dee Dee Blanchard. She had spent all of her life with this lady who has learned to manipulate the system and gain the favor and sympathy of others as a result of her medical condition. And she went to school and she got straight A's and she took this young man and got him to do her bidding. Was that the case? How much of this should we, should we actually place on Nicholas? He was the one that actually committed the act. But had he never met Gypsy Rose, would he be in a similar position? I don't know. We got, I have some thoughts on that, but I think that we need to go more in depth about Gypsy. So. Eliana, what do you think about all of that? There's this whole dynamic about Gypsy, the Munchausen by proxy victim at the hands of her mother, Dee Dee Blanchard, who is longing for some separation from her mom. She's longing for independence. She's coming of age as this, this adult woman that wants to break free. She doesn't want to be in a wheelchair anymore. She wants to have boyfriends. She wants to have friends. She doesn't want to be forced to do all these weird surgeries that she's doing. And she had been victimized from the day that she was born in 91, all the way up until now. Um, and then she finds this young man, Nicholas Godijan. She meets him on Facebook. They belong. They, they, they begin this online relationship for a long period of time, inevitably ending in the death of her mother as they both came up with this plan over text message and is well documented. If you're, I don't know if you're going to be able to find the actual transcript of the text messages, but if you wanted to know what they were talking about leading up to the murders, it's out there. If you wanted to find it, there's a, there's a YouTube video that literally has uh, frame by frame as they were being displayed in court, what they were talking about. And so, but it paints a picture. Nicholas Godijan was a 500 year old vampire. And he was, you know, Jekyll and Hyde. And the good part of him was this guy that was of moral character, that just wanted a family, the white picket fence, this very juvenile, idealized idea of what marriage was. And he was very much in love with Gypsy. But then he 
oh, he was the one that said, hey, I got split personalities and I, I'm, my name is Victor. And Victor is the doer of evil. And he gets me to do very bad things and he's capable of killing. And he, he's talking about the depths of Victor. And together, they concoct this plan to murder her mom. And then it goes down and it happens. Nicholas, prior to meeting Gypsy, had a criminal history. He had exposed himself in public. It wasn't a violent crime, but he was a sex offender, basically. <clears throat> he had violent tendencies. There were things that he, were, that he was saying to Gypsy through text message and from Gypsy's account in person that caused her a severe pause at one point, wanting to break up. And then he says, hey, let's try it again. And so what are your thoughts on that whole dynamic between the two before we even get into any of this? I can't really say that like he was completely manipulated by her. I think they fed off each other. Like he was giving her what she wanted or needed as far as like this fairy tale relationship. And he was getting that, I guess, submissive type of relationship from the other. And through that, I think they were not really thinking about what they were doing. I don't know. I, well, do you remember the whole BDSM thing that he introduced yes. her into? And so submission mm -hmm. was a, exactly. a large part of it. And mm -hmm. she was going to be submissive to him mm -hmm. to do all of these sexual things. But that also extends in the BDSM community to other facets of life. Exactly. Extreme obedience in, in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Whenever I think of BDSM, I always think back to Pulp Fiction. That, that guy, you ever see that movie? I haven't seen Pulp Fiction. Ileana. <laughs> I know. It's just one of those seriously. movies that... Uh, Dominic, Dominic. <laughs> you're so fired. <laughs> if I had known that you'd never seen that movie. Well, there's this scene. It, it, it's very graphic. It involves a, a, a sexual assault of another male, male on male. Mm -hmm. And they had in this closet, this guy, they called him the gimp. He was like in this body bag type of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was this weird BDSM thing. And it was like BDSM to the extreme. Like you're going to sit in this coffin until we call you. And okay. it's bizarre. But when I think of BDSM, that was always my vision of it. <laughs> Not my thing, mm -hmm. but that's what I know of it. But he was into that. Yes. So. Let's talk about the timeline. So Gypsy, she's born in 91, July 27th, 1991. 91, I was, at that time, I was 10 years old. I was 10 years old. And mm -hmm. let me see, in 91, I, I think. I was five. The Twins won the World Series. Like gas was like a dollar or something. But <laughs> a dollar. It was something ridiculous or like 80 cents. But she's born to Didi and her, her father. And the strength on the strength of that very quickly after marrying. But before Gypsy was born, I'm assuming while she was pregnant, they decided to get married. Ronald Blanchard, her dad. Now, Ronald was 17 years old. Um, I have a 17 year old. I couldn't even imagine her coming to me. Say, hey, hey, dad, I want to get married. Like, no, the hell you're not. What do you mean? Getting married to who? But like, at that time? <laughs> I'm, well, at that time, they did things a little bit yes. different. Back in 91, even going back, you know, uh, the story of my own grandmother. She met my grandfather when she was like 16 years old. And my grandfather was like 39 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And my grandma was telling me this story, I mean, w many years ago. But as I'm replaying it in my head, about, oh, yeah, I was working at the grocery store. And then I saw grandpa come in and he had these big arms and he was so handsome. And then he was asking me out. And I'm like, Grandma, you are a child. Yes. <laughs> that is a crime. <laughs> so, but at that time, it was pretty normal. It was normal. It was normal. And my grandmother was born in Mexico. And so I believe the age of consent mm -hmm. back then and even now is like 16. To get married anyway. And so they did. That was origin story. But never mind. He's 17 years old. He is getting, he gets married to Dee Dee. He's not really feeling the marriage, you know? In love. <laughs> yeah, he's not really all that in love with her. He's like, well, I mean, 
is this what I'm going to be living the rest of my life with? And, you know, Dee Dee wasn't back then, you know, grotesquely unattractive. I mean, she was a normal looking, I think she was 23. She told him she was 21. Yes. Uh, but still the prospect of we're getting married now and I'm a dad and we're having a child and all right. So death do his part. It was a bit much. So they called it quits. Um, it wasn't until about 1996 for the first four or five years, Gypsy is leading a relatively normal life. But in 96, as the first time that Didi claims that Gypsy had suffered from medical conditions that required her to walk or not walk, but use a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And that kind of going, and I told the whole story and Didi tells us, not Didi, Gypsy tells a story about how she was riding a motorcycle with yes. her grandfather, there was a minor accident. She scraped her knee. And she said, oh, no, you need a cast. Next thing you know, she shows up with a wheelchair. And then the family's like, WTF? What are we doing? Because she was out there jumping on the on the, on the the um, trampoline. trampoline not too long ago. And now she's being paraded in a wheelchair. Well, that wheelchair uh, for the next 19 years of her life uh, would remain a fixture in Gypsy's life. And I don't have that that, that much patience. I mean, I can't imagine... It bothers me to sit down for too long. I got to get, like, I got to run around, you know, walk the dog or something. But, and imagine as a young child, you want to go out, you want to run and you want to play. And she's already doing those kinds of things with all the little kids around her. And she's confined to this wheelchair. And Dee Dee's like, yeah, this is what, this is what we're doing now. Crazy. Gypsy goes along with it. But when you're four or five years old, there's no defense to that. There's none. So I talk about my kids an awful lot on the show. Um, but my daughter, she's about to turn five in March. And I couldn't even imagine telling her, um, hey, you can't walk anymore. She'd be like, the hell I can. <laughs> <laughs> Sprint running. <laughs> What's keeping me in the chair, guy? <laughs> That's what she would tell me. Not even if you try to probably, like, if you strap them, they'll just mm. wiggle, wiggle out of the chair. So, <laughs> yeah, it's... wiggle out of the chair. And when I put them, when, when they go to timeout, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, we have like this little guardrail on the stairs that locks the top stairs from the downstairs. And I put them on the other side of it. So they're like in jail. <laughs> but then even then, Olivia's like, she'll, she'll, she'll just, well, all right, I'm just going to climb over. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine how, I mean, I don't know, because I don't think they go into details, but how... Did she get Gypsy to just stay still and in that wheelchair and not move? I mean, I know they mentioned that she was told not to get out of the chair, but. Yeah. Well, I think that when you place the child in a cast, mm -hmm. which is what Dee Dee did. Okay. Then it, it, it lends credence to the idea that, hey, there's something wrong with you. You need to sit in this chair to get better. And then when Dee Dee and Gypsy were alone, just themselves, not around people, she would get up and walk around. Oh, yes, yes. And no, so she would, you know, that would do a lot to kind of calm her anxieties, nerves, I'm assuming, to, I guess, dull any pushback from any of that. But when they were in public, that's when it was like, mm -hmm. oh, no, I can't walk. And then she told the story about Heather on the trampoline. And then as soon as she's jumping and having fun with all of her friends. And then as soon as mom pulls up, she flops down like a fish. And then Dee Dee just threw a fit. Don't you know that she's a cripple? And that's kind of how it went between the two of them. And there's not, when you're five, there's not much defense to that. No, of course. When you put your foot down as a parent of a five-year-old, there, there's no pushback to it. They push back against their mom. But when I use my dad voice, oh, it's like, voice. oh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, my wife like will wrestle with them. Brush your mm -hmm. teeth. You're gonna brush your teeth. All right, we're gonna. I want you to brush your teeth. It's been like it'll be like five minutes of this. I'm like, Avalyn, right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Even my dog responds better to my husband's voice than me. <laughs> <laughs> I know the effect. <laughs> yeah, and and so that that's kind of what she was subjected in in the course of so the early 2000s we start with the wheelchair she's subjected to numerous surgeries she's prescribed numerous medications um in the early 2000s because Dee Dee is manipulating a variety of different medical professionals there's some uh, uh, let me just explain there is a whole contingent of people out there that are attacking the medical claims of gypsy and of Dee Dee, 
And there's even some that are going so far as to say that Gypsy was not a Munchausen candidate. She was in on the fraud or whatever. I'm not going to get in on any of that because I disagree. We're not going to have evidence to corroborate that story as it is right now. What is undisputed is this. There was a feeding tube placed in her when she didn't need a feeding tube. She was subjected to multiple surgeries. She was purported to have MS. She never had MS. She was never diagnosed with MS. There was definitely a doctor or two that suspected that Munchausen by proxy was a thing because of symptoms that should have been there that weren't present because of Dee Dee's saying, oh, she has this, this, and that, and say, well, our tests are not showing that. And then there was even the doctor that had failed to report to a CPS what he suspected, but he basically said he asked her to stand up. And depending on who you believe, there's there's multiple versions of the story. He asked Gypsy to stand up, and she does stand up, and Gypsy or, or Dee Dee flips out. Or the doctor asked Gypsy to stand up, and then Dee Dee flips out and just says, we're going to another doctor. Whichever account you believe, he clearly said that there is not a medical reason that I can give that would corroborate that this child can't walk. She should be able to walk. And then that's when they wanted to say, all right, let's do more neurological tests. Is there something neurological? And then he had suspect in Munchausen, but he doesn't report it. That's a different story. We're going to get to that in a minute. But so all of these things are going on, whether or not the, whether or not you believe the entire medical account that Gypsy says, or that has been pushed out by law enforcement, because there is a whole independent um, movement that is basically uncovering fraud that was going on within the doctors in this case with respect to, with uh, respect to prescription medications and all these other things okay. that said, none of these things ever happened. This doesn't make sense because of that. I don't have time to get into that. We're not going to get into that. Just know that there is a group of people that disputes the medical information, but what's not disputed is that Dee Dee was 100% running a fraud on the doctors. Yes. Dee Dee was 100% instructing Gypsy to act in a certain way to corroborate what she was telling the doctors. And she was 100% prescribed medications and treatments that didn't fit any medical condition that she had, that 100% st stunted her growth, caused the teeth in her head to rot out of her mouth. And there's even people that dispute that. It's like, oh, well, the salivary gland thing, maybe it was just poor oral hygiene. I don't know. Nobody knows. I don't have definitive proof to that one way or another. I personally buy the story that she was taking medication that caused the, her teeth to run out. But just know there is competing theories. That's not what this show is going to be about. I'm really here to just talk about the human aspect of all of this. And so if you're going to attack me in the comments for that, I know it's coming. <laughs> just know I know that it's coming. I know that you disagree with a lot of stuff she says. I know that. I really do. And I respect it. And I don't know all the answers. I know that there's one account and I know there's this other account. Which one is true? I don't know. I haven't been hired to advocate either way for the case. I'm just kind of going by the undisputed facts in hope to gain some kind of insight into the human condition by discussing this case. So fast forward to 2005. After Hurricane Katrina, Katrina, Dee Dee and Gypsy, they're relocated to a special needs shelter in Covington, Louisiana. And this was brought about because Dee Dee had presented photos of their destroyed apartment um, and claimed that the flooding had ruined all of Gypsy's past medical records, which makes no sense because at what point were medical records digitized? I want to say like back in the 90s, like even in the 80s, they had stuff like on microfish that you would just the... pop in the little cartridge and yes. the scroll wheel. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. And also the floppy disk, is it called? Yeah, yeah, floppy disk. Floppy disk. Yeah. That was actually one of my, when I was in college, one of my jobs, I would create microfish. It was the most boring thing ever. It, it, oh, That's I, I hate, It was so monotonous. <laughs> I did that for like a day and it's was like, I quit. I can't. I can't even. So they get this. She tells this story right away. She, lay the, she lays the foundation, which she would tell doctors, whether or not it was true or not, she would tell doctors that all of, Gypsy's medical records were destroyed by her Kane Katrina. Whether or not anybody fact-checked that or not, whether or not anybody actually followed up with her lifelong pediatrician, which Gypsy certainly had one, 
and he's still practicing today, I believe in LA. I might be wrong on that, so don't quote me. But she would tell doctors that, yeah, we don't have medical records, but she was diagnosed with these things, and then she would get these treatments. What the, what the detectives found when they were researching, not researching, but when they were canvassing the crime scene when Dee Dee was, where she was murdered, is they found a cabinet full of medications, yes. right? In like perfect working order, like you would see at a pharmacy. They had everything like breathing machines. They had whatever medication you could, could, you could describe. They had cough lozenges in there and everything. It was a farm, a little pharmacy. But in there was a prescription book that yeah, Dee Dee stole. Mm -hmm. stole from one of the doctors. So she's writing her own prescriptions. That's and so nice. at some point she didn't even needed to do the Katrina thing. She just, you know, write them herself. And I don't know if you mentioned it in the introduction podcast that you did last week, but if I'm not mistaken, she had been a nurse too at some point in her life, or she studied for to be a nurse. So she had a little she had, bit, yeah. She had a little bit of understanding of like medical terms and stuff like that. So she will she was good at convincing the doctors with medical terms of what um, Gypsy could maybe have. Or suggesting like she might have this, and then yeah. that will open like the window to get I don't know treatment for for medicines for that specific. Uh, condition. I think I um, I think I did mention that one of our one of our very loyal listeners that actually commented on that video was is an actual nurse. Okay, and she was kind of schooling me on like the history of uh, this case mm -hmm. and asking me to look into different things. But she was a nurse herself. And I think what she was saying was Dee Dee had like a very basic elementary, like you just said, mm -hmm. knowledge of the medical jargon and would know certain things to say or not say and or directions to point a doctor uh, to get certain things done. Yeah, that was 100% a thing. So she used that. Um, so while they were at the shelter, uh, a doctor had suggested that they should be re relocated to Springfield, Missouri. And at that point, they cut the media's they caught the media's attention um, when Habitat for Humanity got involved. I once did a thing for them way back, like in '98, uh, for a church thing I was doing. They're, they've been around for a long time. Yes. So it makes sense that, you know, they would get involved with this. But they had volunteered to uh, pay her bills. Uh, for the. They had installed a wheelchair ramp in their Springfield home. Uh, they were featured on these media outlets that were receiving all kinds of public sympathy. And you've seen the clips. Everybody's seen the clips now where Gypsy's kind of rolled out there and they're, you know, big smile on her face. Uh, cutest little kid. I mean, she's shaven bald head because she allegedly had... Um, Leukemia. Leukemia. Yeah. Uh, and Gypsy, this big smile, but they're getting the whole celebrity treatment, paparazzi and everything. And they were, they were, they had a trip to Disney World. They had received a specialized car for wheelchairs and gifts from the Make a Wish Foundation. So they were kind of a big deal back in 2005. And I want to say that I sort of kind of remember that. I also don't know if my memory's making it up just because I've been researching this case, mm -hmm. but I've been aware of Gypsy Rose, I want to say, since she pled guilty to murder in 2015. We talked about it briefly, about some of her testimony that she gave for like maybe 10 minutes on a prior show we did, maybe a year ago. I'm pretty sure that I, I knew about the case that was about two years after I finished law school, so I I was pretty aware of what was like the big cases around that time. So I'm pretty sure that. By I the way, I just want you all to know that Ileana Clone Rosa, oh our <laughs> Ileana, has been selected to be a super lawyer in the. Rising the, star. A rising star <laughs> from super lawyers in the United States of America. It is very difficult to make that list, but for whatever she's doing, she's only been practicing for a short period of time. Was it three or four years now? In California since 2020. Yeah, so you are a, a litigatory baby, yes. and she is a rising star currently on the list of super lawyers in the state of California, and so I wanted to give a congratulations to her. <laughs> if any of you were wondering what kind of attorney Ileana is, well, she's a freaking super lawyer. How about that? <laughs> but before I get off case. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we should make you dye your hair for that. Oh, and 
I think this is the first time that Eliana has ever joined us in drinking in the morning. It is 10 a.m. and we are fully drinking on a Friday morning, 100%. Uh, weapon of choice this morning is Templeton Rye. Um, Eliana is enjoying it with some Diet Coke, as is Dominic. I don't want to make too many comments on that, but <laughs> I already made mine off camera. <laughs> so I'm enjoying my neat as it should be. Uh, all right. So 2007. 2007 was the first time that there was any mention or suggestion that Munchausen by proxy was a thing with respect to Dee Dee and Gypsy. There was a pediatric neurologist. Bernardo Flasterstein, and he's the doctor that has been on all of these documentaries talking about, look, look, I should report her. I didn't report her. I didn't have proof. I didn't have to, I, I, I couldn't prove it. That's the guy with the white hair, right? Yeah. He's the older yeah, doctor. doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, white hair. He's got like a, he's got an accent of, I want to say it's a German accent, maybe. Okay. Flasterstein. It has to be. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Eliana, what is the legal standard for a medical professional to report anything related to child abuse it's mandatory. to CPS? Their mandatory report is in the state of California. I don't know if that's the case over there, but it's the case over here. But what's the standard? It's mandatory if you have a reasonable suspicion that abuse is afoot. You have to report it. Yes. Some doctors have refrained because CPS sometimes is a little over the top in how they litigate those cases fast Flashback back to the uh, Maya Kowalski case. Remember that one? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. that one with the documentary with the uh, Taking the care of Maya? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mother that ended up committing suicide because the judge in the dependency case said, no, you cannot visit your daughter and give her a hug. Next day, she was hanging from the rafters of her garage. An ugly case. Sometimes CPS goes too far and sometimes they do nothing at all. They're, I was going to say just that. They go to the extremes, either yeah. too much or too little. <laughs> An extremely frustrating agency to work with. But any lawyer knows it's the lawyer's job to prove what's going on. The doctors just have to raise the suspicion. And then we bring the doctors in to say, why were you suspicious? And then they present their evidence. And then the attorneys, along in the context of everything else, are it's their job it's our job to prove abuse one way or the other or whatever they're alleging. This doctor said, well, I can't prove it. So I, I couldn't prove it. And if I reported them, then she was just going to have an excuse as to why. It's like, I'm sure she would, as would anybody in the history of humankind who has ever been accused of anything that they didn't want to be found guilty of. But his duty was to his patients and he failed his patient. And one of the questions that I have been asking, as have a lot of other people that doubt Gypsy's story, why wouldn't she, now that she's out of prison, scream to the high heavens that I want a civil suit against all the doctors that didn't intervene when they could have done something about it back in 2005, six, seven, all of these things, all of these surgeries that I was giving, all of these prescriptions uh, that were being prescribed to me that I was taking, that was rotting the teeth out of my head. Why would she not go after them in civil litigation to recover awards for her obvious irreparable damage and, you know, her pain and suffering, all of those things. Why wouldn't she? And my response to that is maybe she should. And I'm maybe pretty sure there, there's, a, there's, there, there's a statute of limitations. I don't know what the rules for tolling the statute are when you are in prison, but I imagine that she could defeat a statute of limitations claim should it be a thing or a defense or a valid defense in the case of these medical doctors. But I don't know either. She's already answered. She already knows the answer to that question. She's yeah, it's, you know, if I was going to bring a claim like that, it would have been like back in 2013 and I didn't. So I don't, I don't know. I, maybe she doesn't want to go through. I mean, she has had enough with her case. She doesn't want to go again. That is the thing. Yeah. I mean, it is a mental toll to have to go through the entire life that she went through just to prove what she needs to prove in one of those cases. She's been a prisoner all of her life. Yes. The joy that she was able to touch when she was imprisoned by her mother was Disney fairy tales. She didn't have the most sophisticated of legal minds. No, she didn't. It wouldn't be top of mind to think, oh, I should sue, you know, even though her mom was kind of 
well versed in how to collect social security checks. She was getting, she was 100% getting a gypsy's social security checks. She was living off of her daughter. And exactly. I'm, I'm going to get to that, but I'm getting far too off track. So Dr. Flasherstein, he noticed that even though Dee Dee had insisted that Gypsy had muscular dystrophy, that Gypsy's weaknesses were characteristic, were not characteristic of the disease. Her markers were not characteristic of somebody with MS. He said that there was a strong possibility of Munchausen by proxy with maybe some unknown etiology to explain some of her symptoms or some neurological reasoning, maybe, uh, maybe her, you know, whatever he was medical stuff. And he doesn't report this to social services. Like we just said, he talked about, he said that he had been told by other doctors to treat the pair with golden gloves. And I don't know what that means. Golden gloves is a boxing term mm -hmm. and doubted the authorities would believe him anyway, but you still raise the suspicion. That's all you're required to do is to raise the suspicion. He failed her. If you're filing a lawsuit, Dr. Flasterstein would be, I feel like, target A, along with the hospital and all the other doctors, maybe her pre pediatrician that had referred Gypsy to Dr. Flasterstein. At any rate, friends started taking pain pills. Gypsy started taking pain pills after her extensive surgery. She was 15. But the craving for the pain pills had continued. And so not only is the Munchausen by proxy a thing, not only the false claims of muscular dystrophy and of leukemia and all of these other ailments, but because she's on all of these surgeries, she is high constantly from the time of whenever she started getting the surgeries, but at least 2007 on all of these pain pills. And she was taking some nasty ones. Suboxone, I think was one. I think she was taking some oxy. She was stealing some of the, of um, her mom's pain pills, but that was her escape. That was her disconnect from her prison from the age at the very least of 2007. That would have put her what? 15, 16. Hey, um, drugs. Do something to a teenager's brain. Oh, of course. They do things to a a child's brain. I don't know what doses. And these are a lot of these claims are from Gypsy herself. Some of that, some of it was claimed by the prosecutors in law enforcement. But if she's high all the time and you know, she's being fed Disney, a steady diet of Disney fairy tales, and she's constantly in surgery, she's in all these wheelchairs, the doctors are starting to get suspicious. What development, what development, what developmental harm do you think when it might have befallen Gypsy as a result of all of that? I'm just so curious. Like, what was she? I know she is now. Yes. The way that she sounds, the way that she looks. She's put on a lot of weight. She looks healthy now. Yes, she you know? does. But back then, she was like emaciated she was. with the feeding tube and all of these things. How did it affect her development as a person? How did it affect her personality? Because those are things that are going to last into her adulthood. And we'll talk about some of that. You know, she's married now. Yes. <laughs> she's and been I, out of prison for like a month. And I think that's one of the effects of what she went through. Like leaving jail and uh, getting married right away. <sighs> I'm going to reserve my thoughts. <laughs> I have things to say <laughs> about her getting married. But okay. um, Dr. John Fabian had mentioned in various interviews that one of her coping mechanisms in prison was drugs. She's, she's taking drugs in prison. She was seeing other women get high and look, drugs are prevalent in prison. She said she started off vaping. She said that, you know, she was taking various things, but one of her coping me mechanisms, which she learned in early childhood was to make herself chemically high. And that's what she would do. She was borrowing money from her stepmom. She had recounted in one of her documentaries, the latest one, that she borrowed $50 from her stepmom because she said, oh, I just, I owe this money, whatever. It's because she owed money for drugs that she was taking uh, while she was in prison. And then what Gypsy had described was, that was learned behavior from my mom, manipulating and lying to people. So she's fully acknowledging mm -hmm. that she has these personality flaws. 
and that she herself is stating that I picked them up for my mom. What was her mom a master at? Manipulating and gaining sympathy for her daughter and herself. If you listen to the uh, prison interrogations, when she was arrested and she's talking to law enforcement, she puts on the full-on production. Oh, yes. The full-on production. And what was most telling for me is like, there's this point where she's saying, oh, I was raped and I was all of these things and he wanted to kill my mom and I'm the victim and all this stuff. At first, well, first thing, she didn't even acknowledge that her mom was dead. She acted like, she's dead? Really? And then the waterworks, right? And then she's trying to deflect blame. And then law enforcement just kind of says, look, we know that you were involved in this. We got your cell phone records. And then she's like, okay. I'm going to tell the whole truth now. And so, and she kind of spills the beans. I halfway think that she expected that she was going to walk out of there because. She did. She, she said so in the documentary that she thought that she was going to be able to walk out. You're like, right. I do remember she that. She was so naive that she thought that she was going to be able to do that. But she, all, all of her life. Um, she's been seen as this victim and praise, and nobody has ever put her to the grinding stone to test her character, to test her personality or whatever, other than her mom, right? And so, yeah, that, I guess that makes sense that she would think that. Um, in 2009, the police received an anonymous call expressing doubts regarding Gypsy Rose's health. And in September of 2008, Gypsy's pediatrician, her nurse goes to her with three separate documents. Or that her pediatrician discovers, he was on the documentary talking about when he discovered there was like three different birth dates for Jeff. Oh, yes, the years. Yeah, his nurse. 91, 95, and uh, some other one. In 91, 93, 95. Yes. And then, like, the way that he's describing it, he says that I'm, I'm physically affected right now. Like, he's going through, like, this physical reaction because he had, I don't know. But he says he called DFS. He says that I'm concerned that this child has been kidnapped. He didn't say Munchausen. He said, I think this kid has been kidnapped. And he's saying that they, they called Dee Dee. They grill her about the birth certificate. Nobody ever follows up on it. He says, I asked Dee Dee to bring Gypsy in. I told her that I was the one that called Department of Family Services on her. And then asked her to leave the room because I wanted to talk to Gypsy at this point. And then he asked her if she's okay. And then Gypsy's like, yeah, no, I'm fine. And uh, are you sure? And he says, that, no, everything's fine. And he says, my concerns were not assuaged. But I felt I had done everything I could do, which I guess, I mean. That's the most he could do. It's weird to me, though, that he would not have just said, is this a Munchausen case? Should we look deeper into her medical records? And I don't want to be that guy that plays Monday morning quarterback and that says, like, well, he should have just known. Wouldn't it have been obvious? I mean, yeah, let's look at all of the possible things it could be. It could be like a, a like 28 different neurological things that are going on, psychological uh, explanation, explanations as to what's going on. One of them may be Munchausen, but Gypsy reports and appears to be fine and all of this stuff. And other than the three birth dates, I don't really see much reason to doubt what's going on. And so he just said, eh, did what I could do. Gypsy says, well, Gypsy was in prison during an interview. She says, well, how do you know that the doctors aren't just saying this stuff to cover their ass? Which leads me to believe that she's 100% had thoughts of civil litigation against yes. the doctors because she does not even believe that the doctors are being truthful here. And then in the latest Gypsy documentary, um, this doctor was being, well, I just, I wish her the best and I'm sorry that I failed her. He seemed genuinely remorseful. And I felt bad for him. But you know what? Reporting her to DFS should have prompted all of the investigations that I just described. All he had to do really was alert. I mean, to ask him to be like detective number one on the case and you mm -hmm. have to just, you know, find out all these things that are going on is a little unfair. He wasn't the only doctor that was involved. There were many. <laughs> we still have Dr. Flasterstein. And this was after Flasterstein had already... Um, Sus uh, suspected Munchausen was a thing back then. So that is what it is. After the visit, Dee Dee becomes 
paranoid. Way more paranoid. Imagine all of her life, she's been getting, she knows for a fact that she's defrauding everybody. She knows Gypsy was not born in 1995. She knows that the, 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 the train of, of, of checks from the SSI is going to stop. And what's more, I believe that Dee Dee, look at her life. Look at what she's gone through. From her family accounts, she was this person that was doted on by her mom. More so than any of the other kids. All the other kids, it was, it was normal. But mom was attached. Dee Dee was attached to the hip to her mom. That was her main source of love and affection. She meets this guy, Ron, and she gets pregnant by him. They get married and Ron rejects her. And Gypsy, really. Just, hey, I'm too young for this. Her only friend in the world, the only relationship that she's ever cultivated because she's kept everybody on the periphery. The only rela relationship she's ever cultivated was Gypsy. And now you got DFS showing up to her door on the verge of exposing the fraud that has gone on for years. And so, of course, paranoia. Of course, yes. She blacks out the windows, remember? She tightens the reins on Gypsy even more than they already were. And at this point in 2009, Gypsy is like 17 years old. She is a young woman that is on the verge of adulthood. And in spite of wanting to keep her locked up as a child in mind and in thought, there are other chemical processes taking part in her adult body that give her very adult urges and needs that she needs fulfilled. And so she's reaching out because her mom is not enough. Her whole world can't just be Disney and Dee Dee. And so in 2010, all of this needs bubbling up for Gypsy, this need to escape, this need to be normal. I'm not this uh, five-year-old little kid anymore, whatever. She finds the Medicaid card, realizes that, hey, I was not born in 95. I'm actually like 18 years old. And uh, the way that you hear Gypsy describe it, she's emboldened. She confronts Dee Dee. And then they tell a story about how they go into like the staples and then yes. Gypsy is sitting there and then Dee Dee comes back with this doctored birth certificate and says, see, do you believe me now? And so even then, even though the lie has kind of been exposed, Dee Dee's still trying to kind of play it up and gaslight Gypsy into thinking, no, 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 I was right all along. Never mind all of the parental alienation that's going on because, you know, her dad, father. he's not much of a fighter and he didn't really fight for Gypsy in this case. Uh, I'm not saying he did anything all that crazy. I'm just saying that I've seen dads fight harder. No, he just sat back, relaxed, focused on his life. That was with this, with the, I guess, the stepmother now. And he just, from what I could tell, he seemed confident that Gypsy was taken care of and that yeah. Satisfying. They, didn't, they didn't need him. And he was sending some money here and there. And it was okay. Like, And he had a new wife. Yeah. And there's a lot of fathers like that. So... It, it's just it was like this it was like hey i want to see G uh, i, I want to see gypsy and dd chimes in you're a piece of shit you never did this and that you know what i'm good with all that exactly i will write a check mm -hmm. i will keep in phone contact with gypsy i will do you know there's some some people don't have the energy to fight with all of that and we don't know because i don't think they go into the details they don't. of the relationship who knows what Diddy was asking or doing or saying to him. But you've been that... practicing. Okay, so you've been practicing for four years, right? You've seen these cases. I've been practicing for oh, 10 yes. years. You could kind of just fill out the pleadings already. Oh, yes. Mom is acting as the gatekeeper to the minor child, Gypsy Rose. Every time father tries to make an attempt to be a part of the Gypsy's life, Dee, Dee shuts it down and insults him and hurls all of these accusations of that he's a deadbeat dad he doesn't pay child support he doesn't do enough i'm the one doing this and that and you don't even do these things and he's constant constantly insulting his intelligence and going back to these emotional attacks and all dad wants to do is be a part of gypsy's life and he's blocked at every turn by dd blanchard yes those are the pleadings i don't know if that's true or not but i guarantee you if i were to represent ron in this case 
that would kind of be the framework of the pleadings that we would write and we would have all of this evidence based on text messages and phone calls and all those things. I don't know. What do you think? It wouldn't also surprise me that she wasn't over him and there was a lot of, because from yeah. what I saw in the documentary, he started dating who's Gypsy's stepmother now when Gypsy was, I think, three or four months old. A much younger and attractive woman. Yes. So, and she was very clearly aware of that. Yes. I mean, and just knowing about Didi and how she was with Gypsy and her family, it wouldn't surprise me if there was a lot of a drama involved about his new relationship and that maybe drove him even farther apart. I mean. Yeah, it is. Gosh, it is. It is so hard for dads when you're dealing with a parent like that. I mean, when I get those clients in my office, I'm like, listen, listen, I'm not going to go in there and why don't you want dad to have, why, what do you mean you want to put down on supervised visits? What did he do? What's the safety concern? Exactly. Riley doesn't know how to change diapers. The instructions are on the box, young lady. They can learn. Yeah. It's not that you want them to take a parenting class because the reality is your child deserves to have her father in her life just as much as her mother. Mm -hmm. She needs both. I understand I've had these I've had these very candid talks that I understand that you feel like he failed you in the relationship and that he's left you high and dry. But, hey, we're not playing that game anymore. This is the co-parenting game. Co-parenting requires a great deal of maturity, a great deal of forgiveness and a great deal of selflessness, none of which are the features of a narcissistic person that is prone to victimize their child mm -hmm. with things like Munchausen by proxy, things like inserting a feeding tube into their body uh, to control That's the crazy. nutrients. That, that is nuts. That, that was like one of the biggest, I mean, from all of the surgeries, that was the one that I was like. Phew. That's the one that, that pissed me off the most, yes. honestly, the, the feeding tube, because it's yeah. like, come on, man, I need my meat and potatoes or something. I need to grow. Child needs to grow. The child is tiny. Dee Dee is I don't know how tall Dee Dee is, but Gypsy, when she was a child, was tiny. I mean, she looks like a normal woman now. Yes. She's, like, she's filled out great because off of prison food nonetheless. But she is. She doesn't seem to be like more than 5'2 or something like that. Uh, that's, that's what I would guess. Yeah. That's what I would guess about 5'2. I don't know. So. <sighs> Vision Con 2011. The sci-fi convention. She meets a guy named Dan at this vision con convention, sci-fi that she was into these things. She would dress up in costumes and it was a thing that she would do. It was one of her outlets into the outside world. She meets Dan and they would talk about common interest. They would friend each other on Facebook. They would talk about sci-fi stuff. They would talk about sex. Their, their, their conversations would get sexual. She said, I thought it was a possibility that he was my knight in shining armor. Everything to her is knight in shining armor. There you go. <laughs> I'm a damsel in distress. That's her only framework of reference. And then after a while, they've been talking. She says that he told me he was on parole. I don't even know what parole was. And this is around the time that she found out that she was really 19 years old. I don't know. One of the things I said on the last show was, I don't know if he thought that she was 15 or not. And it was like a, a pedo or if like he just... All right, well, she's 19. I guess she's of age, and so fair game. But she was relieved to be able to confide into somebody. She started dreaming about what it would be like if she was just a little bit older, and maybe she could be more relatable to him at being a 35-year-old man. She had talked about the Medicaid card. She wanted to stand up for herself. She realized at this point, she said at this point, I realized that the wheelchair that my mom wanted me to sit, to sit in was a con. She started to become privy to all of the fraud that Dee Dee has perpetrated on the medical community and how she's manipulated the, the public and all of these things. Dee Dee was 100% receiving the SSI benefits from Gypsy. Dee Dee's source of income was Gypsy. And so she had a fundamental interest in preserving the lie. But now it's all starting to boil to the surface. 
and Gypsy is asking questions. And that was the one person that she can control in the past. But you're not going to control a 19-year-old that wants to have a boyfriend that way. Mm -mm. No. <laughs> it's, it's not happening. It's the whole Catholic school rule thing. You could keep them, you know, chained up if you want to, but they're going to sneak out at night. I just... I hate the fact that I have daughters, you know? <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> oh, all daughters, all of them, all of them. It's like, Jesus, I couldn't even get like a little enforcer, you know, to like, oh. But you have a the male dog, right? <laughs> What's the dog going to do, man? <laughs> a little bit of some, uh, emotional support. <laughs> even the male dog, even the male dogs in my house, like have like this feminine energy about them. It's like, oh. I was telling my wife the other day, there's way too much feminine energy in this house. Like, what is the deal? Because, like, my wife was getting all, oh, I'm feeling emotional. I want you to hold me. I want you to, you know, I want you to tell me that you love me and all these things. And then Avalyn was doing the same thing. Oh. And it's like, you know, you guys can't both be on your menstrual at the same time. <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> oh. Well, my husband feels the same, but hey. I sympathize with your husband. Hey, it's and the dog uh, is a female, so hey, there you go. He has a son, but because he doesn't live with us, he gets maybe like a couple of months with some someone to share all the toaster on, and I go crazy those months because all I hear is them screaming and jumping and running and throwing the ball and playing video games. And it's like, I need to get into my room and be like, okay, put on my music because it's just way too much. But at the same yeah. time, just a couple of months from an entire year, I'm, I'm good with that. But I'm used to, I, I understand because I'm used to, I guess, the feminine er energy in the house. Oh, so much. And it's so different. <laughs> I take it out on Dominic. I take it out on Dominic. Oh. Say, hey, hey, Dominic, you want some whiskey? You want to put some go. Diet Coke on it? <laughs> You want me to put a little umbrella in your cup too? <laughs> oh, among other things that I say, but oh, so all right. Getting back to this. Yes. So now, Dee Dee is aware that she's met this guy named Dan. And then she tells Gypsy that, you know, she can leave. Or or he's telling Gypsy that she can leave. Yes, he tells her, like, hey, you're I'll an adult. protect you. Mm -hmm. I'll take care of you. And then the plan was that she was going to leave and live with him at his home. They were going to move to his farm up in Arkansas. And then she makes her first attempt to run away. Oh, she it, runs away. She did. Yeah. yeah. For the for the very first time. I mean, she got away. So she, when her mom was sleeping, she steals her mom's cell phone. And she texts him. She says they're, they're about to run away together, right? She packs a few costumes because she didn't have any real clothes. Costumes. Her Disney costumes. Jesus. She, there, there was this whole confrontation between her and Dee Dee where she says that, I know that I'm 19. She says, I try to stand up for myself. She said, I, I, I try to talk to her. And then that was the whole Staples thing, right? But when she's running away, she leaves through the back door. It was late at night. It was about 2 a.m. She hitchhiked to a friend's home, which is a, is, is, is a, I don't know how to reconcile that. Hitchhiking is not really a thing no. in 23, let alone, well, maybe it was back in 2011. I don't know. That's kind of scary. Okay. Let's just buy the story. She hitchhikes to a friend's house. Um, and then he tells me that he's on parole and he can't leave the state. We're not going to Arkansas. We're staying right here. Um, and then my first reaction is like, oh, shit, she's going to find me. And so around 4 a.m., her mom wakes up. She knew that she wasn't there. She found her cell phone, I guess. Um, she steals her mom, but maybe didn't have texting capability. I don't know. But she sees the messages back and forth between her and Dan from the convention and then she goes out looking for her around 8 a.m she shows up to dan's place where they're already sitting and then she arrives at the door him and her and dan were sleeping she sees her walk into the door she sits up and the first thing she tells her is I know that I'm 19. I'm an adult. I can make my own decisions. She's trying to do that whole thing. All right. 
And then she says, she asked, where's my pills? She's talking about her pain pills, her medication pills, basically insinuating that I'm going to call the cops. You have stolen from me. I'm going to call the cops. They're going to arrest you and all this extreme manipulation, yes. right, at this point. I give her the pills. She says, she, she gives her the pills back. Then she asks, where's my money? And I gave her the money back. It was like $1,000 that she stole. And she says that she, they, they had this conversation on the porch. And then Dee Dee's telling her, if you come back with me, I will let you see Dan. You can have a relationship. It'll be fine. Um, and at this point, Gypsy is 100% completely dependent on Dee Dee. She has no lifeline outside of Dee Dee. I mean, I guess her dad, but she has never Strange. thought so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But she says, all right. On the way back, I'm confronting her about my age. And this is Dee, Dee or, or Gypsy talking about Dee, Dee. She tries to confront me. Otherwise, she stops at the staples. She has a copy of her birth certificate. She manipulated to say it was 1995, probably used whiteout or something, a copy machine. She says, there's your actual birth certificate. Now do you believe me? And I did believe her. I still loved her. There's been, there's been a lot of people that have chimed in and, and have suggested that Perhaps Gypsy had a form of Stockholm Syndrome, which is a thing. It was in the, the, one of the documentaries. The latest one, Prison yes. Confessions. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know if it's Stockholm Syndrome as much as it was. That's, well, I mean, that's her mom. That's She's lived there all of her life. I mean, I guess, I guess there's probably tie-ins. But yeah, and so she's very easily manipulated by... Dee Dee, not only that, she loves her. That's her mom. And if you hear her talk about even the, to the point where the day of the murder and the things, in, the, in her heart of hearts, she didn't want her mom to die. She just wanted to be free. She just didn't know a better way. What's the only way that Sleeping Beauty got free? Well, they slayed the dragon. What's the only way that Rumpelstiltskin, not Rumpelstiltskin, Thumbelina, not Thumbelina. What's that? Tangled. What's the Tangled movie? The girl the with the hair. with the long hair? Yeah. The only way that she got free was by poisoning her mom or her mom didn't get her life essence or whatever. I have seen too many princess movies because I I've don't seen remember. Them all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember any of that. I, I remember Snow White and Cinderella and that's pretty much it. Oh, I've seen them all. And, but the, the, the common trait in all of those, the, the stepmother, you know, they, yes. they all get their comeuppance. Uh, the Wicked Witch in Snow White mm -hmm. uh, is, is murdered viciously that's how she's going to gain her freedom that's how she forms this plan so at any rate she gets back home and at this point now let's visit the mindset of Dee. Dee. she's been visited by dfs the medical professionals are suspicious of her gypsy is asking questions her paranoia is through the roof. She's already blacked out the windows. She's already attempting unsuccessfully to limit the contact, contact of Gypsy to the outside world. So now what does she do? If, if you hear Gypsy describe it, she's chained to the bed. She thrashed her computer and her cell phone, just destroyed it. And she was chained for two weeks with handcuffs and a dog leash. Chained to who? Well, to her, to her mom. Yes, exactly. Dog leash to her mom, and I guess the handcuffs to the bed, something like some, that. Some variation yes. or, or both. I don't, it would still. be weird. The, still, whenever she would move, her mom would know. She was at Dee Dee's mercy for everything to go to the restroom, for food, for, for water, for sustenance, for going out in the sun and getting some vitamin D, whatever it was. As punishment, she wouldn't feed me for some days, and then she would eat whatever she wants, which is unbelievably cruel. That would piss me. I was like, no, no not even. You're giving me some fries. The hell with that. We're going to fight. We're going to fight. But even then, Gypsy is like 80 pounds. And her mom was a heavy set woman at that point. You know, she's probably pushing 180. I'm guessing from her pictures. It doesn't I matter. <laughs> but she probably had 100 pounds on Gypsy. There was no fighting. There's no wrestling. All these thoughts that I have instinct is not working out for for gypsy in the same way um as punishment so, so she she Dee, Dee knew that gypsy was afraid of her and she played up on that there was no there was never an indication 
for Gypsy that there was ever going to be an end to this way of life. <clears throat> Her best attempt to escape thwarted. Mm -hmm. And there were repercussions. No more computer. You don't get a cell phone. And now you're sitting here on a dog leash. Could you imagine? Without food, well, limited food and everything being controlled. She was a prisoner, so it's... I don't care if it was her mother. She was a prisoner. <laughs> the abuse didn't stop there. If you believe Gypsy's account, Dee Dee had never physically laid a hand on Gypsy until about that point. And then after she had met Dan and when she gets her back to the house, any time that she was displeased by anything that Gypsy had done, there was a beating in tow. She would hit me, she says, with coat hangers, hands. She would punch my leg in the thigh, give her a Charlie horse. My dad used to do that. He's like, hey, who won the race? Charlie! Boom! Oh <laughs> it's, like, it's like, oh, that was really... He was joking around when he would do that. Nowadays, they would call that child abuse. So for two weeks... She's trying to gain more of uh, Dee Dee's trust because she doesn't want to be in a leash anymore. There's lots of begging. After the two weeks of being chained, this is the most bizarre point of the story that I believe has probably psychologically affected Gypsy the most. Dee Dee puts a full-on voodoo spell on Gypsy. You recall that story? Yes, I do. She goes and buys from the supermarket a cow's tongue. She had a picture of Dan... She had a picture of Gypsy. She puts it in a mason jar. And I think she lit it on fire or something like that. Or she put it under... Am I making up the fire thing? Am I wrong on that? I believe... I Yeah, I think they mentioned something about fire and then they... Uh, no, no, no. A hole. It was worse than that. It was... They put the tongue in the jar and some of Gypsy's menstrual blood... Yes, that. Buried it in the buried, backyard. Yes. And then said, "You." her, her mom is telling... 19-year-old Gypsy, you will never find love. And then you, you're you never going to be happy. You're never going to find love. And then she's going into this whole account where everybody that I get close to leaves me. She's talking about her ex in prison. It's like, I mean, so much for her to learn. This is adult yes. Gypsy now, apart from her mom and all of these things. But it's, I guarantee you, has affected her psychologically. I'm pretty sure, and they're, they are from Louisiana, where that is, like the voodoo, it's very, I guess, prevalent and big. So I don't know how much she knows or she believes about that, but... Well, her family talks about Dee Dee. They said that she had a wizard tattooed on her leg or something. Yes. That she would play with magic. Mm -hmm. That she would play with a Ouija board. Yes. It was like... They described it like the scene out of Carrie, that old horror movie from like 19... Yes, I know which one you're talking about. Dominic, when was that movie made? Like 1977? Carrie, yeah. Uh, he was not even a, a thing. Dominic was not... It, it was, <laughs> was in the 70s. That he, it was... Yeah. Uh, it was before I was born too, but I remember watching that movie. Oh, I wow. I was obsessed with 70s movies for a while and that's one of the ones that i watch 70s movies are intense man yes <laughs> if you get in on 70s movies and they catch you catch wave like that there, there's a whole string of movies that is like must watch cinema you yes. have to watch it carrie's one of them uh, they're all gonna laugh at you is one of the oh that scene with the mom at the very end i remember thinking of as a little boy i was like what is she doing? And she has like the cross and like they had all of these weird, bizarre religious tropes in same 70s movies. I mean, The Exorcist kind of started all of that. And then from The Exorcist, you got The Omen and all of these other movies. Carrie came about and people were obsessed with religious dogma, ideology, artifacts, visuals. Carrie's that one scene at the end where her mom like catches on fire it's like oh i remember watching that like on channel 13 and i was there would come on tv it's like wow that that movie was terrifying that image of her covered in blood carrie yes, covered in blood like the... john travolta and those guys oh we're getting off topic yes <laughs> right so yes going back she that's i guess she believes maybe that that affected her in some way she believes it but i believe it mm -hmm. on the way that she has behaved 
in every relationship since. And we're going to talk about that. The end. We've already been going for an hour. I don't know if we're going to split this in a couple of episodes or not. It looks like we probably are, but we still got to get to the, I got to speed this up. Okay. So, Can we take all right. In three, two, one, we're back. All right. Let's fast forward to October, 2012. And when Gypsy first meets Nicholas Godijan, they had met on this online website, ChristianDatingForFree.com, which I've never personally visited, but it sounds like if, I, I, I guess if you're looking for a dating website, that would be at the top of the list. I don't know. Gypsy, she, her, her options were very limited, but she's looking for a, I guess a Christian man you hear Gypsy describe it she says I was obsessed with Disney princesses especially Rapunzel we just talked about Rapunzel Gypsy had formed the belief that she had found her prince charming in Nick Nick was looking to connect with somebody and was sort of a sort of similar to Gypsy in that respect. He functioned. Now, according to his according to his defense attorney, Nicholas Godijan functioned at about a 15 or 16 year old level. He was extremely low IQ. I and mean, if he would believe his defense attorneys, he did not have the requisite mens rea or lack the capacity to form the mens rea or mental state to commit first degree murder. That was the hallmark of their defense. The problem with that is when you listen to him, when he's being interrogated by the investigators, it's not that he sounds like he's an articulate man. It's not that he sounds like he's, you know, the, the most intelligent of people, but he's reasonably intelligent he's able to have a conversation and he's carrying on with the uh, detective and speaking just fine would i guess from that conversation that he had an iq below say i don't know 80 which i believe is the standard uh for mental impairment i would not have guessed that from his interview um but if say given the benefit of the doubt Back in, I think it was 2018 or 2019 or something like that, or, or more recently after the interrogation, he gives another interview to the television, to a television reporter, basically confessing again to the murders. Yeah, I did it. And this is how it happened and all this kind of stuff. And he's talking and communicating as if he's a functional adult. Well, one what of the you... things, I don't know if it was mentioned in the beginning of the documentary, but I think they mentioned that he had Asperger's. Asperger's, yeah. Asperger's, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. Well, he's 100% autistic. He's mm -hmm. on the spectrum. Some have quoted Asperger's. That's not really a thing anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've, I've been told or in my research, but he's on the spectrum somewhere. That's indisputed. Mm -hmm. The question is, you know, you could be on the spectrum and, you know, immensely intelligent. Yes. Think Elon Musk, yes. or you could be severely impaired. Mm -hmm. Where he was, was somewhere probably in the middle of, Maybe not exceptional intelligence, maybe not even intelligent, but adequately intelligent to at least have a conversation that made sense with the detectives to form thoughts and ideas about uh, what happened on the night of the murders, February 10th of 2015. And so I don't believe that he was so impaired that he lacked the capacity to form the intent to commit first degree murder because there was clearly plans yeah i mean i think he knew what he was doing he was a lot more sophisticated than he's been given credit for yes i agree he has his whole fantasy world that he had developed and cultivated online his whole persona was online the multiple personalities victor the 500 year old mm -hmm. vampire he was telling uh, gypsy stuff about that he wanted to do and then it, like one of his fantasies was like you're going to have my baby and then our child when she turns 13 years old i will uh take her virginity and that caused oh he was saying stuff like that <laughs> and so he wasn't like this innocent person the mm -hmm. way that i was thinking he might have been last week when i really hadn't done much research into go to john he had a criminal record 
He's a sex offender exposing himself in public. He didn't have a, he didn't have a violent criminal record, but the things that he was saying in text messages, he was clearly the ringleader in some of it. Gypsy was sort of the cheerleader. Yes. It was kind of my, what I gathered from all of that. And, you know, what is the, what is the largest animal that you've ever killed? I've never, well, insects. I don't insects. Think. Okay. What's the yeah. biggest insect that you've ever killed? Maybe a cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm a big animal lover, so oh. I even like lizards. <laughs> so. I once drowned a rat. Oh my goodness. I like rats. <laughs> well, it was in my house and I caught it and then like it fell oh. into like uh, this it fell the into um well it was in the it was in the trap, but then I didn't know how to dispatch it. And so I drowned oh it. <laughs> and I felt like so oh it was Yes. <laughs> I felt like a horrible person. You know, but it was it was it's difficult to kill things. It is. Oh, I killed once a what is it called? A pollito. Uh, a pollito? A little chicken, like a baby chicken. You killed a little chick. Uh, you killed a chicken. By accident. How dare you? <laughs> I gave the little chicken banana peels and i guess they cannot eat that and oh he died. yeah <laughs> that's the only thing that i and i felt horrible afterwards but not on like i've never done it on purpose other than insects i once tried to nurse a baby bird back to health it Aww. had obviously fallen out of his nest i yeah. found it in the grass like oh this poor thing I didn't know that you're just supposed to leave it there because the mom was going to go okay. get it. Yep. Nope. I took it into the house and I tried to feed it like ham <gasps> and like <laughs> water. I was like shoving its beak into the water. It's like, oh drink, little God. fella. And then it just it passed away and Poor I felt kid. horrible about it. But I was a kid, you know. It's difficult to kill things. It is. There's no dispute. If you have a conscience. <laughs> and you understand. If you have a conscience. There is no dispute by law enforcement, his defense attorneys, or anybody else, that Nicholas took a knife, that little tiny jagged knife that Gypsy had stolen from him at a Walmart, put on those gloves, snuck into that house, and stabbed Dee Dee Blanchard 17 times, nearly severing her head from her body. I don't think I could personally do that if it wasn't like I'm defending like my 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 wife or my daughters or something. And the way that he described that when he was being interviewed, like, oh yeah, one of them, I felt that it went through the lung because it was hard to remove the knife back. Yeah. And the way that he said it, so like, like as calculatingly, he, and like as if he's talking about something very, I don't know about what he ate in the morning. I don't fault him so much for that though because. One of the marks of autism yes, is that emotions. you lack the emotional mm -hmm. effect. Yes. And so I give him the benefit of the doubt for that. Mm -hmm. But even considering it takes a lot to get a person to do something like that to anybody. Yes. Let alone a, a woman that you're stronger than and that is weaker than you. And then it, it, I, I couldn't even imagine. It takes a certain level of mindset, a certain level of mentality. He claimed, oh, yeah, I have this side of me. It's Victor. He kind of like described it. It's like, yeah, I'm a normal guy, but every now and then Victor wants to come out and do evil things. And so that's not unique. That That's not a symptom of his autism. Mm -hmm. That is something that is her inherent within his psychology, separate and apart from autism or whatever. Yes. However you want to, I don't know if I'm even qualified to say that, but he clearly formed that plan. He clearly formed that persona and he clearly carried out the act. If I put the knife into Gypsy's hand, could she have done the same thing? I don't think so. Well, we do know this. There was the BB gun incident. Yes. Remember? So she tried, yeah. That's she picked true. it up. She didn't know it was a BB gun, but she picked up and just started firing that that sucker. But shooting somebody is a lot different than murdering somebody with your hands with a knife. That is not over quickly. There's a lot of screaming. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of blood. It's a lot more personal. A lot more personal. Like you're looking in that person's eyes. She's standing a distance away. 
it's not the same level of monstrosity to kill somebody in that regard. She had it. She 100% had it in her and 100% formed the plan to murder her mom. That's, there's no, mm-hmm. she admits it. She just, matter of fact, do you recall that video where she's making the stabbing motion? Yes. So she makes this video for Nicholas. It's like, here, here's the whole outline of the house. And uh, this is how you're going to get in. And this is my mom's room. And then as she's standing over her mom's bed, she makes the stabbing motion. And she tries to justify it and say that, oh, well, I was on, I was on, no. I was on pain medications. I was high as F. And, um, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. But, hey, that's that. When her defense attorney saw it, his defense, her defense attorney saw that. And when he said, when I saw that, my heart just dropped because we had at once this, this, this young girl that was victimized, Munchausen, my proxy and all the thing. And now she's making stabbing motions. You know, what is her level of involvement? How are we going to defend her from this? At that point, there was no defense, but she had gained a, a significant amount of sympathy from the public. And, you know, the chances are the DA did not want to take the chance of trying to prosecute her for second degree murder and running the risk that she has a sympathetic jury that finds her not guilty. And so she pleads to 10 years in in prison. And I thought that that was fair. I mean, she's out now. She served eight years of it. (laughs) But there was certainly a part of Gypsy that was able to form those thoughts. But the way that she describes the murders is extremely heartbreaking. I mean, she had severe remorse as it was happening. She didn't want it to happen even. Let's talk about that. Let me continue before I get too far ahead of myself. So she's describing her relationship with Nick and, and how it kind of developed and how they're talking. They had formed this plan that they were going to meet up at a theater. They were going to play. They're, they're going to this Cinderella. Yes, the, the new Cinderella. Mm-hmm. Hey, Dominic, last time you flashed like this graphic of the old Cinderella. And I was like, that's not the Cinderella they were talking about. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't get a comment about it. The new Cinderella. It was the new Cinderella. Whatever came out in 2015. I, I feel like I took my daughter to see that movie back in 2015. But it was like a non-cartoon version of it or, I don't know, some kind of Disney movie. I feel like I know. I don't know. But they go to see this movie and the plan was, oh, it'll be like we never met. Now all of a sudden we met and we're making friends and everything. We don't have to hide anything. And there was new details that came out about this. So they go and the plan was she was going to lose her virginity. She makes a motion to her mom. I go to go to the restroom. She meets Nicholas in this bathroom stall. And the way that she describes it was, I've never seen a penis before other than my grandfather's. Mm-hmm. And I won't get into too much of that, but yes. she we had alleged that she was sexually abused by grandfather. I believe her. I believe her. Grandfather denies it, whatever. As soon as grandfather put the blame on her, yep. I, I was like, you're guilty. He had the you're weirdest guilty, reaction. It's like, well, if anything, she came out on yes. me. It's basically like, what he said. As it's soon like, as you he were said creep. that, it's yeah. like, okay. Guilty you're, AF. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what they do. They put the blame on the other person and become the victim all of a sudden. Like He reminds me of the guy that I pled to. Uh, the guy I told you about, the gave yes. that little girl AIDS. He reminds me of that guy. 100% he did that. Uh, yes. But she says, oh, I've never seen a penis mm-hmm. before. And then she says it was disgusting. He couldn't get erect. They couldn't even really perform the act. So I don't even know if she actually, she actually lost her virginity. She said that she didn't, but that she considered that she did. Oh, she called it. We're just going to call it. it. Yeah, yeah. She called it, but it didn't happen. You're right. That's, that is what she said. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, that's not the way it had been described ever mm-hmm. prior to that. And which is, I, I guess, you know. That's- Can you imagine this girl that her only reference to like the sexual world, it's Cinderella and <laughs> whatever this guy, Nick, has been telling her about what he likes. Like she's. She was probably so lost in that moment, like what was happening and what was actually what, like, I can't. Well, she had this weird ability to just kind of let things go. Yes. Like, okay, she's ignoring all of the bad parts because Mm -hmm. she wants to force the good parts. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? She has this pathway that she wants to take. And Nicholas is like, hey, we're going to get married and we're going to have a child. And when she turns 13, I will take that child's virginity. She's like, no, I break up. And then three months later, I was like, okay, I forgive you. You're my Prince Charming. And just this, this weird ability to disassociate and uh, redefine things in her life. 
Um, but that was her experience. And it, yeah, it didn't go the way that she had planned. But worse for her was that it, her mom didn't approve. Nicholas was weird. He had tried to make conversation with Dee Dee. And the thing that he wanted to talk about was the weather or something. Yes. And then like Gypsy's like, seriously, seriously, you couldn't think of anything better than that. And she, she almost called him dipshit when she said, I felt like, <laughs> I don't know, but that, that was her, her, her recounting of it. He had this weird statement that he wanted her to repeat. He had this controlling yes. way about him. And so their dialogue, it was fun. It was about a fantasy world that we had created together. It was a way out of my reality. And when I was home with my mom, we would argue when she'd catch me on the PC, as she had scheduled more surgeries and medications, she's still continuing with this munchausen and things like, Jesus, they removed this girl's salivary glands. They wanted to get a, a surgery to fix her vocal cords because of her high-pitched yes. voice. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I mean... It's hard for me to judge high-pitched voices because I, I tell my, my wife she sounds like a pterodactyl. And like uh, my daughter, Avalyn, is like a pterodactyl junior. Olivia has a little bit of bass in her voice. She's more like her dad. <laughs> but, it's, but how does a pterodactyl sound like? like I don't know. <laughs> like, wah, wah, wah. You know? Oh, okay. I don't <laughs> like, know. Like, or I'm not a pterodactyl. You're right. How does a pterodactyl? <laughs> an eagle then? I don't know. A bird? She sounds bird. like a bird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But whenever she's like yapping at me, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, Jesus. It's like I'm I'm at the freaking zoo. With I <laughs> think that's probably the sentiment of most husbands when their wives are like yapping. At yeah, it's like, oh, it's so like grating. It's like, God, why you got to be so mean? You're not being mean. It's just your voice. Like you could sound like there's there's a deep voice that could sound mm -hmm. mean and scary. And then there's this grady, high pitched voice like the wicked stepmother. She didn't have a deep uh, a, a screechy voice, but <laughs> when men hear voice, yes, it, that's how, that's it, how sounds. it sounds. It's like yes. this high pitch. My daughter has it so bad. She's like miniature pterodactyl. Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> Olivia is not that way. Olivia, she's got a, a deeper voice, mm -hmm. like a, kind of a more, oh, she got more bass yes. in her voice, but she's, she's more manipulative than her sister is. Oh. <laughs> so they got their own personalities. <laughs> No, oh, no, but I, I have had friends that have really high pitch voices, mm. but I never really question why. I just thought they were like that, and apparently there there could be a reason why people talk like that. Like I, I have one two of the hallmarks. Friends, like they talk like gypsy or worse. Yeah. Like like really like a little 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 girl and super high pitch. Yeah. Like to the point where my husband is like, how can their husbands like be with that voice all day well that but a high-pitched voice like that is a sign of trauma oh matter of fact in, in many cases it's a sign of sexual abuse oh. and i don't know if well gypsy was clearly sexually yes. abused yes um but i had a client once she was an exotic dancer mm -hmm. and she had this very childlike yes marilyn monroe voice and at the time I had learned through uh, another case I had that an expert witness had said that one of the hallmarks of sexual trauma is that you grow up and you maintain this childlike high pitched voice. It's like, Oh, that makes so much sense because that client, particular client that I had mm -hmm. had been through so many things in her life. I, I felt really heartbroken for her, yes. for her story. So, my wife doesn't have a high-pitched voice like that. It's not a childlike high-pitched voice. It's just a pterodactyl. She's a pterodactyl. She's a oh my goodness. She's a she's an animal, an eagle. She's a bird. <laughs> you know, I was making fun of her the other day because you know when she lays in bed, like she has like this pillows, like she makes like this nest for herself. It's like so you're gonna go go up there and sit in your nest then. It's like yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, my husband calls calls it the. Muraya China, the Chinese wall. The Chinese wall. <laughs> yes, because the Great right, Wall of China. Yes, it, that because I have so many pillows, and especially through the pregnancy, like I had all these pillows, mm -hmm. and I it I create kind of like this fort, I guess. Yeah. And it's, they're all just around me. And they're like, okay, you're gonna go to your little fort. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I do this sometimes when I don't want to get sick because she's always getting sick. And when she gets sick, then I get sick. I was like, no, you're not breathing on me tonight. And so I'll put like a little Aww. pillow fortress on my I hate bed. to say that if you're in the same room. I know how it works. I know how it works. I know it's not working out. It's just psychologically, I maybe know. it'll work out. I know. <laughs> but okay. So before we get too uh, far off track. So. Nicholas and, and Gypsy, it doesn't work out with their mom. Um, he had this way of, uh, so here's Gypsy. She's starving for affection. She's starving she for something other than her mom. Still, she yeah. still is. <laughs> and here's Nicholas ready to do whatever, whatever it is that she's missing. He's delivering it. And, but he's very controlling. Every time they, they get off the phone or, or sign off on, uh, online communication or whatever he wants her to say i love you and adore you my king charming good night it's like that is so creepy if my wife told me anything like this i wcf is wrong with you say like, what are you on it's like what the, that, that would just creep me out to the max but they're, they're they have this whole bdsm thing going on and it's just i don't understand it if that's your thing all the more power to you. But this is kind of how it was just his thing. He wanted to be seen as like this perfect thing. That was the only thing sustaining and maintaining gypsy when she with her mom. And then the way the gypsy describes it, I couldn't really tell, see what was happening. He was my hero. I had villainized my mom. I did not see the connection in their behaviors. The connection being mom is controlling. Mm -hmm. Nicholas is controlling. She's attracted to that sort of thing. She's been conditioned to be attracted to that sort of thing. And I would argue that her current husband, I was telling my wife, that effing guy. Yes. Red flags, domestic violence, abuse, controlling. Controlling, yes. Jealousy. Um, Jesus Christ. Could she just, um, I, could she have just like stayed single for like a couple of years? out of prison and date around and see like all the different guys that are out or there. Or like the stepmother suggested, yes, you can continue dating him, but Keep you don't have him. to marry him. Like yeah. you can just leave prison, I don't know, start dating like normal couples do. <sighs> like they're not in one in one in prison and then if it works great, you can get married later, but this whole getting married before she leaves, I find it like a as a controlling measure by him where once you leave, you're yeah. married. I was thinking like all the time, like, oh, she's going to wear these khaki pants. She can't wear a dress like, hey, dipshit, you could just wait until she gets out of prison and then have the whole ceremony. What's the rush? Mm -hmm. She ain't going anywhere. You know where she's at. And then that, you know, red flag number two. And then, you know, he's heavy set, he's extremely heavy set. He's not an attractive man. And I don't know the standard for attractive men, but the attractive men that I met, imagine is not that guy. I mean, he's not horrible. But he's extremely over. Here's my he's, thought. He's big, but there's people that don't mind that. But I think compared to Gypsy, Gypsy is pretty. I find her pretty. So I, I don't know. I I guess. Here's my biggest concern. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with how he looks. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with how he mm -hmm. looks. But he's very clearly insecure about oh, it. Oh, he is. Yes. He has insecurity issues out the wazoo, and. He's like deathly jealous of her ex-boyfriend, who's like this skinny, tall white guy from what I could see in the pictures. Um, Harry? I think it was. Yeah, he's he's very insecure about whether or not Gypsy's gonna stay loyal to him. And he already looks like he's tipping like the scales at about 380. He doesn't look healthy. No, he doesn't. Like he might not be around for the next 10 years if he doesn't do something about himself. And Whatever that's got to be, I don't know. But he does not look healthy, and it's only downhill from here, buddy. And so, I'm just reading, insecure. He does. He knows that he's not the most attractive. He's not unattractive, but he's not secure in himself to see that. He talks to Gypsy in a certain way. He has no problem raising his voice to her. No problem using profanity at her been talking to her in this domineering tone and a lot of that is fueled by his insecurities domestic violence yes. and we deal with these cases all the time and what is one of the hallmarks of 
domestic violence. One of the biggest motivators of domestic violence, <sighs> jealousy, the marriage is falling apart. Who were you talking to? Who you been with? Where have you been? It's always something tied to that. We find Apple tags super glued underneath the car. Oh, Apple tags. <laughs> <laughs> Some things is like, oh, this case. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We've we've had cases like yes, that though. But yes. these are the hallmarks. I was telling my wife, this guy scares me for gypsy. Yes. Why don't she just like take a few years and just figure it out, man? She's gonna have plenty of suitors. She presents herself as an attractive young woman, but with the with the baggage of being convicted of second degree murder. But also, uh, her new husband is the kind of guy that would write somebody in prison and fall in love with somebody who's in prison. I was going to say that. Like, I know there's a whole community of there people is. that like, they correspond with people in jail. Christopher Watts, the guy we're about to do another show on? Yeah. Well, that's what everybody voted for. It was okay. either that or the, 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 there was a number. We did a poll. Okay. People want Christopher Watts. So Christopher Watts. And is. whether or not Chris, uh, Nicole Kessinger is guilty of murder. Okay. We're going to talk about that next week or in a couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, why, th there's a whole community of people that write to these people in prison and like yes. fall in love with them. And I don't understand I, the psychology. Exactly. There's something missing in their lives that they cannot create a relationship with someone that is out and free, in, I guess, in the world. Yeah. And they have to seek those people that are in prison and that's i don't know what it is but yes there's something weird in there and like i said this guy he's not horrible he's not missing any limbs he's not missing like an eye i've seen people that look worse and they're able to find somebody yeah. to like partner with i think this guy has some skeletons in the closet and that's yeah. why he resorts to looking at love or for love in prison like <laughs> red flag you know it's yes. just if it was if, if gypsy was my daughter but hey hey i know you love this guy i know that now, they mentioned that the dad is like if you want to get married <laughs> just go do it and it's like god <laughs> i would be like hey, if he ever raises his voice if he ever talks to you sideways if he ever puts his hands you let me know and i will bring myself and the family army and we will come down and rain hellfire upon this young man i don't know how old he is but he looks like maybe 35 ish yes, or so. I was going to say late 30s. About her age. Maybe 40, yeah. About her age. Maybe a little older, but we're, we're so far off track. We're going out <laughs> of order. It doesn't matter. So, Nicholas, go to John. The BDSM finish. Gypsy describes it. It made me feel empowered to be submissive to him which is a weird psychological dynamic that I don't understand. She said that she felt that he was a very disturbed person who created his own fantasy world. She said that. So she had recognized early on, if you believe her prison interviews, that he was disturbed, clearly the fantasy world, but she didn't see it. I mean, it's, we're able to view it from 20,000 feet. I feel like she was kind of in the forest, of blinded course. by the trees and the leaves and the branches and all. Um, the bubble. The bubble. She confides into a friend that she had met this guy, Alea Woodmanzi. She was on the 2018 documentary. That's the neighbor? I forget if it was a neighbor or if it was a family friend, but if somebody that she would confide yes. in. Alea Woodmanzi who had no idea, by the way, that they, they were basically the same age at the time, but she was confiding Alea and Gypsy because she thought that Gypsy was like 15. But she was confiding into her, in her with uh, respect to Nicholas that she and Nick had discussed eloping and even choosing names for protect potential children. And then Alea's like, hey, pump the brakes. Maybe not so much. Maybe not so quick. Either way, Alea tries to talk her out of it. She believes that she had been taken advantage. She thought that Nicholas was a sexual predator. Nicholas was just this autistic guy that operated at a very base level. I don't want to say he was below average IQ. He's probably average. He was a child. He created a whole online fantasy. I've met people like this that were not autistic with average intelligence. 
that their only frame of reference is what these, this online persona that they've created and had nothing to do with their mental deficiencies. Yes. Exactly. And so if you want to use that as a hallmark for he lacked sufficient IQ, I disagree. So in early 2015, Gypsy, the, well, that early in 2015 is, is basically when they met. We talked about how they met and they, they go and it doesn't work out with a mom. Interestingly, mom, at this point, she takes out a durable power of attorney. What do you know about those, Ileana? Mm, well, I don't do them. <laughs> Come on, super lawyer. What, what, WTF, <laughs> tell me about durable power of attorneys. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I mean, I don't do them. I know a lot of people oh. that don't want to deal with an attorney. They tend to get those with a notary. It's just... Uh, it's it, just a power to somebody else. If to somebody lacks capacity, yeah. it gives them the authority to exactly. act as their basically their agent acting in their best interest and yes. all those things. And it usually becomes the focal point for an probation. What am I thinking of? Probate trials. Probate, yes. Yes. Probation. Jesus. Probate trials. Yeah. Undue influence and all those mm -hmm. kinds of things. But Gypsy was trying to take out a durable power of attorney in the name of Gypsy to basically control all of her affairs. Here's where it starts to get a little bit weird. That kind of makes me think she probably did that because if she went through a conservatorship, then there was going to be a third party doing an investigation. and she. I feel like that was coming. You're right. You're right. I know like... You know, like they ask you, like, what have you done in these cases to not have to do a conservatorship, like the least restrictive uh, type of yeah. help and power of attorney is one of them. Right. But I'm thinking she probably was trying that because I don't know if she was going to be able to hold. I don't know if the interviewer was going to do a deep investigation to realize, like, hmm, like, there's something weird in here to grant the conservatorship. I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't, if it, they may have been trying to go the conservatorship route, I don't know if it was going to get that far. I think she just wanted to be able to continue cash for SSI yes. checks. Yes. But at that point, Gypsy's like, I'm never going to get out of this. I'm never going to get out. She doesn't like Dan. She doesn't like Nicholas. She's going to keep me trapped here in this wheelchair forever. Mm -hmm. I I know for a fact this is a medical fraud. I don't need to be in this wheelchair. She's getting frustrated. Yeah. I want to be an adult. I want to live my own life. All of these things. So at this point, she starts to converse with Nicholas. They start to form the plan. Hey, babe. Um, he says, I will protect you from anyone. These are the uh, text messages, a short transcript of them. And she says, anyone? Yes. Even my mother? Mm. Yes. And then the, he starts talking about fantasies of murder and rape and crime. And then she tells him, or he tells her about Victor, the 500-year-old vampire. Victor loves to kill and would kill my mother, kill her mother for her, for her, so they could be together. And then he says, dear, never underestimate his will to kill. And also, give me your address so I make sure I have the right one. They're formulating this plan to murder Dee Dee. He directs, she said, he directs her to do research about ways to commit mur the murder. And then they talk about maybe we could buy a gun. And then he says, no, no, no. That's too loud. Far too loud. And then they formulate the plan. What about a knife? Oh, perfect. We settle as the knife is the weapon. So she steals a knife from Walmart. And then she starts talking about in her documentary, I thought about cutting myself. She says, I was a scared little girl. I was trapped. I was trying to get out of a bad situation. Here's what I felt about her prison confessions. I've talked many times on the show about Alan Watts and Jordan Peterson. And one of the things that they have in common is if, if you ever want to experience true freedom in life, then tell the truth. Live in the truth. Bathe yourself in the lake of truth and the truth shall set you free. And I very much felt like in these, in the prison interviews mm -hmm. that she was, oh. I feel like, you know what? Screw it. I, I, I've already been convicted. I'm serving my sentence. Not, they can't do anything more to me. So I'm just going to let it all out. I really feel like her prison interviews 
is her her greatest moment of candidness where she yes. has nothing to lose. She's telling the complete truth. I really feel like there's she's never been more credible than her most recent documentary series in these prison interviews uh, that they did with Lifetime or whatever it was. And so she yeah. seemed very, very genuine about everything that she was saying. She's not going to get penalized for this. She no. doesn't have to tell make up stories. She's kind of she no. already testified to all the stuff back in 2018 at go to John's trial. And so there, there, there is no reason for her to lie. She's literally just trying to work on herself. She's being truthful about her situation. She wants to find a way to live a normalized life as an adult female. And here we are. She says, I was a scared little girl. I was trapped in a bad situation. I wish she said, I wish I would have known. I wish I would have known that I didn't have to commit this crime. Had I asked a responsible person to commit murder, if she says, if I would have asked a responsible person to commit this murder, he would have said, no, stupid. <laughs> no, stupid. <laughs> We're not doing that. All right. We're not doing that. We'll call the authorities. We'll do something else. She says, if I would have confided in a friend, they would have talked me out of it. But I was talking to Nicholas and he was like, oh yeah, I'm Victor, the vampire. I will slay your mother and your honor and we'll, we'll live happily ever after. But that was her cards. That's what she had to work with. Nick said in text messages that he wanted her mom to suffer as much as possible. That is an involuntary state. That is, that is a voluntary statement that was not prompted by anything that Gypsy said. There's no reason to make her suffer. That was Victor, his alter ego. Or was it just Nicholas Godijan? And I remember also that she mentioned, I don't know if it was in this Lifetime documentary or the previous one where she says that he wanted to rape her mother. Yeah. And she said, you know what, just rape me instead of her. I was about to get to that, yeah. So... There was going to be a rape of somebody, either your mom or you. What's it mm -hmm. going to be? And then Gypsy's like, it's not going to be my mom, so it's just going to be me. Yeah. That's just how it played out. So he was clearly a guy with these demons. Mm -hmm. um, he had access to evil in his brain. If you want to describe it as he had a demon living inside him by the name of Victor, then fine. But it came from him. It was manifested by him, and Gypsy might have cultivated it. But that was 100% him. He's responsible for what he did. A guy that has the ability to sever the head of a female, innocent or not, has the capacity to do such a thing. I struggle to say it because he was a child at the time. But I mean, gosh, I mean, I could not have done that at 17. Most people I know could not have committed that murder at 17 years old. What's and I that? don't know because it's not really mentioned in this last documentary that i watch but i still haven't heard anybody talk about nick's parents like because apparently he lived with his mom yeah what what did she know about him and his tendencies and that's kind of the 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 look nobody's doing a documentary about nicholas mm -hmm. you know everybody's doing it about gypsy nobody's telling his story and so i reserve a lot of judgment that i have for him um there's not a lot of information out there Unless we're going to go and interview his parents ourselves, which you and I both don't no. have time to do any of that. <laughs> um, but I haven't found anything in respect to that that would shed any light on the situation. But Nicholas had whatever was bubbling inside of him was born from him. And he added it to Gypsy. Gypsy cultivated it. She couldn't shut it down herself. And it happened. And so <clears throat> the plan. He wanted to murder her and dump her in an abandoned farm where pigs would eat the body. They came out of his mouth in the text messages. Logical. Lots of plans have worked out like that. There was a very famous movie made about, oh yeah, we'll just leave uh, the body on the shores of the Florida swamps and the gators will dispose of the body. Yeah, it didn't work out. They found the body. Guy was convicted. I forget the name of the case. Don't want to get off track. <laughs> um, and then he talks about he wanted to rape her with me at her by his side. I was frightened about that. He told me that Victor had rituals that he wanted to be done. He, If he had a daughter on her 13th birthday, he would take her virginity. And then at that point, that's when she dumped him. And then a few days later, 
He messaged me on Facebook. He said, I didn't mean it. It was just Victor. And then she takes him back, which is how I'm getting to this, this conclusion that she had this weird capacity to just overlook things because she wanted so, I mean, if it's she not- She wanted to be free. If it's, who, if it's not Nicholas, who? Like, what are other prospects, you know? I mean, it, it's hard to judge her view on her prospects, but I feel like you could have just moved on to another profile on Christian singles for free or whatever it was. She could have, I, I mean, I don't know, man, but Nicholas was the guy that she chose. And she was so childlike in her her behavior. The only time that she felt cunning and manipulative and able to participate and defend herself was in this fantasy world. The second it becomes real, she's still childlike because she's a child. It's like, uh, hey, I'm the master of the universe and I'm playing, I'm He-Man and I'm the Incredible Hulk and I'm going to slay them, the strongest man in the world until you get beaten up by the bull. And it's like, mom, I need you. <laughs> I remember one time I climbed up in a, I was, I was Superman, I was Batman or whatever. I climbed up into this tree and I was a little bit too high up and I was definitely scared of heights and I didn't know that. And I was like, I'm not coming down off of this tree. You can't make me move. And then it's like, you have to come down off of the tree. It's like, you will call the fire department. They will get a ladder and they will rescue me. <laughs> oh my God. And then you know who came to my rescue? My mom. And she came. It's like, son, get out of that tree right now. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> At least you didn't fall down or throw yourself. I, My brother had this friend in like first or second grade that he believed he was Superman. And he decided he was going to fly. And he yep. had like broken ribs, the collarbone, I guess. Broke his collarbone, yeah. Yeah, he broke it. It was a whole mess. The kid was hospitalized for the longest time. And I was like, really? Like nobody told this kid? <laughs> Poor thing. That Yes, not true. Like, I mean. <laughs> Kids do a lot of stupid things. My brother did that when he thought he was Mary Poppins. I will jump from the roof with this umbrella. <laughs> He didn't break anything. He was fine, but he was a, he was an idiot. I was an idiot. We're all idiots. It was it was a it was our childhood, and it, it was what it was. So let's fast forward to the crime. They're they're clearly coming up with this crime, uh, with, with it with this plan to dispose of Dee Dee. It's her only way out. It's either this or I'm going to be in prison forever. Gypsy feels I only got two options. Either she's gonna either either she's going to get pregnant with Nicholas's baby, and Nicholas ha and and Dee Dee has no choice but to accept as the father of her child nicholas or she's gonna just have to kill her that in her mind was her only two ways out gypsy takes hundreds of dollars from Dee Dee to pay for transportation for nicholas to springfield this plan the plan was he was gonna get a bus from springfield to gypsy's house he's gonna sneak her in he, she was going to pay for everything. She was going to help him out. She had provided him with a knife, with gloves, with duct tape that she had stolen from Walmart. It was initially believed that she had purchased it, but she admitted that she stole that stuff, which makes more sense, I guess. I don't know if it makes more sense or not, but that's what she said. On June 10th, 2015, Gypsy Rose texted Nick, the bitch going to go down tonight. Just the gloves and knife, Nick responded, duct tape too, to muffle her. So they're carrying out this plan. It's in motion. A gypsy said she was going to pre-cut the tape. Nick arrived at the house. Gypsy let him in. And then she hides in the bathroom, their hands over her ears. Here is a gypsy's account. So I woke up that day next to my mom. I messaged Nick. He was already on the bus. My mother and I, we had a moment. Nick told me that I should tell her that I love her. So that's what I was planning on doing. And then she gives, I gave her a big hug. And I remember her telling me, what's that for? I'm not dead yet. She was going to be dead in like four hours. Part of me didn't want to go through with it. She went into Dee Dee's room. I hugged her pillow and had her scent on it. And after that, we started watching a movie. And about two hours later, Nick texted me that he's at the hotel. My mom had fallen asleep. I texted him. She's sleeping very light. If she wanted to stop it, she didn't. She's continuing with the plan. He took a cab over to my house. He arrives at the house. 
He texts her, I'm here. And you get your ass to the bathroom and you open the door. And she does. The first thing he tells me upon entering is that bitch is dead. Hearsay. This is her recount. Yes. And then he says, get your effing ass in the bathroom right now. I get down on the ground. I cover my ears and I hear her wake up. And I hear screaming and banging. It stopped for a moment. I uncovered my ears. And that's when I hear her call my name. Gypsy, help me. Repeated a couple of times. And to this day, I can't get that thought out of my head. I want to help her, but I don't. I just sit there and I hear her screaming again. And there, there was one sharp scream and then it was over. It was silence. I didn't hear anything. I'd do anything to go back in that moment of time. There were so many moments in time that I wish I could go back to. There was still a point where she didn't have to die and I wish I could stop it. And she didn't. This is her words. This is her recount. The sharp scream and then the silence, that's basically her vocal cords being cut. There, Nick comes into the bathroom. He's holding a knife. There's blood coming from his finger. He cut himself, stabbing her. Dee Dee, 17 times. He tells me to clean up. He tells me the whole time. He never takes his eyes off of me. At the time, I was completely disassociated with what was happening. These are Gypsy's words. It was like a bad dream. Nick commanded me to be naked. And the command that because I didn't let him rape my mother, I had to agree to let him rape me. So the story that Dee Dee told was he raped, well, Gypsy told, Gypsy. Mm -hmm. he raped me after everything was done. He commanded me to get rid of the stuffed animals off the bed and he mm -hmm. raped me. Nick was like, yeah, and afterwards we had sex the two diverging viewpoints from one perspective and from the other. Gypsy continues. He told me to take all the stuffed animals off the bed. He was going to have sex with me. And never once was it a fantasy to me. When I yelled, stop, he didn't. I called for, I called for my mother who was already murdered. After I had, he was basically choking her as he was doing this. She blacked out. She claims that she blacked out for a little bit because he was choking me. And when I came to, he told me to get ready. I called a cab. We left the house. I get to the hotel. I was a little frightened that someone had seen me, but I was wearing a wig. I'm taking med pe me pain medications to get high, to disassociate. This was her coping mechanism. I'm in a state of shock. I don't believe any of that happened. Uh, that was my frame of mind. The next day we we're supposed to leave for Wisconsin. There was no ticket available for two days. So we stayed at a hotel. I stayed high on my pain pills. I imagine she probably took some from Dee Dee from the cabinet. She says, I enjoyed being with Nick. I thought, she said they, they thought it would be funny to make a porn video. Yeah, we're talking about brownies and pizza. There was a roller coaster of emotions between happiness and grief. I missed my mom. I wish she was here. Uh, and when we got on the bus, it was so exciting. I felt like I was lifting, winning a trip to Hawaii. I had my camera. I was looking outside the window. I was taking pictures. I was so hopeful for the future. I had stolen $5,000 from my mom's safe. I thought that would be the money that we would live off for the rest of our lives. That's, that's, that's like, a <laughs> that's a mortgage payment. Jesus. Mm -hmm. I began thinking a little more about my situation. I could see that he's not that independent as a man, as I thought he, I would be living with. He had a small room in the upstairs lift. It looked like a 15-year-old boy's room. He had a wrestling comforter on his bed. Freaking Hulk Hogan, ultimate warrior. Her knight in shining armor is a boy. So after arriving at Nick's house, she says it wasn't freedom. She said he was very controlling, predictably. She says that he would pick out what she would wear, what she would watch, what she would eat, just like her mom did. 
And then she starts thinking, did I really just trade in my life with my mom for life with this effing guy? This is what I traded. This is what we went through all of that for. And she talks about the Facebook post. She had tremendous remorse and guilt that had started to surface. The idea of her mom being dead in her bed and no one knowing she wanted her mom to be found. And so she decided to post on Facebook something from their shared account. Her and her mom shared a Facebook account. She said, what should I post? And then she thought about what Nick had said. The bitch is dead. And then a second post, because family members were, start, they, they started speculating that the Facebook account was hacked. Like, if someone put that on your Instagram account. Yes. I wouldn't initially think you were hacked. I would be generally, I would call, okay. Something's going on. I got to get a hold of your husband. What is that about? Mm -hmm. That's weird. Was she hacked or something else? But people are speculating, okay, hacked. So they're waiting for some kind of a follow-up, but it wasn't coming. So she posts a second post to Facebook. I effing slashed that fat pig and raped her sweet and innocent daughter. Her scream was so effing loud. LOL. And she says, I felt that that would alarm people. <clears throat> Alan Voss, the Green County Sheriff's Department investigator, was alerted by the, by the Facebook post. And then he said that after being alerted to these posts, uh, they go to the Blanchard home. Detectives searched the home. They found Dee Dee Murder in her bedroom, obviously. They also found Gypsy's wheelchair that she had needed all the time. Uh, it was still at the residence. And the initial theory was that, okay, she must have been abducted. Abducted. Clearly, it wasn't the case. Mm. <laughs> you know? And it was kind of a shock when they found gypsy at the house if you recall that story they roll up on nicholas's house and they say nicholas go to john come out with your hands up and you know gypsy is is, is is she's hearing all of this and then they instruct her to come out she's walking out and they're like what 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 is this yeah. shifted the course of their investigation to say the least the prison interviews Gypsy and Nicholas separated. They were in there for about four hours before they actually questioned Gypsy. They caught wind of Nicholas's story. I'd imagine they had already gone through all of her cell phone, whatever, communication, Facebook communications, whatever. They knew that, hey, this is not, she was abducted. She was involved in this. And so she goes with this whole story. I didn't know. First, she tried to play it off. I didn't know my mom was dead. And then it was like, oh my God, it was all Nicholas's fault. And I was like, okay, here's what really happened. Three versions of the same story. <sighs> I can't imagine being a part of that investigation and having to go through all of that. I'd imagine that if I had known what I had known back in 2015 about her being in a wheelchair, I would have been like losing my mind. And, you know, so thrilled. Oh, we found her. She's safe. What? She can walk? What? And just, it would have thrown me for such a loop. I, I can only imagine the investigators, what they were what they were thinking. But, you know, at this point, Gypsy's like, all right, the jig is up. She just lets it all out. She lets it all out. She pleads guilty to second degree murder. The minimum sentence for second degree murder in that state, Wisconsin, 10 years. She pled to the minimum possibility of parole after eight. As soon as she got that deal, jumped on it because she was literally facing life in prison. And her defense attorney was like, hey, I saw that video of the stabbing. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> that's exactly how I go whenever she, yeah. <laughs> I cry. <laughs> I, I'm given some evidence that is contrary to my client's version. It's like, <laughs> how many moments have you had? Like, oh, I've had oh. so many. So she, uh, the prosecution had reasoned. There was so much sympathy that's going to come out from this girl because there was a horrific case of child abuse that had taken place where she was clearly a victim of Munchausen by proxy. If you want to leave comments down below, I welcome your arguments about she was not a victim. One person left a comment like that. She says she was clearly not a victim. There was other stuff. She was lying and things like that. The uncontroverted evidence suggests otherwise. 
And I'd love to know the reasons why you disagree with that. But at the very least, whatever you think about the medical conditions and the stuff that was going on with the doctors and the very real prospect that the doctors were in on the fraud, hey, I'm all for that. But 100% Dee from the time that she was four or five years old uh, to the time that she murdered her mom was a victim. She was a Munchausen victim, 100%. Uh, I'm convinced of that. And she is, <clears throat> the, the, the public was catching on to that. All of these stories were starting to come out. It was the greatest shock to law enforcement and her family members and her dad and her stepmom and everybody that knew Gypsy when they saw the video of her walking into court, like WTF. She walks. What? What? It was this bombshell at the time. And uh, everybody was thrown by a loop for a loop with all of that. And uh, well, what do we do now? I mean, you got to recalibrate your thoughts about who was a gypsy, what was really going on. Everybody recalibrates. And so rather than go through the trial and risk having her be acquitted because of the juror's sympathy, the, 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 the PD, the PD, the DA says, plead to the minimum, second degree murder, we'll be done with it. That's it. Done. Later in 2018, she testifies on behalf of Go to John, and she kind of fesses up to her role in the murders and talks candidly about that. The whole defense for Go to John was basically he was autistic. He didn't have, he lacked the requisite ability to form the intent to 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 basically plan and carry out a first degree murder that was just destroyed at every angle. Although the jury did deliberate for four days, so they were on the fence with it. So. But I think I feel like what really did him in when they were able to see the video of him talking to the investigators and when they were able to see the video of him a few years later, basically telling the same story to some TV journalist reporter. Mm -hmm. And there's like, yeah, this guy's first degree, no possibility of parole. He's in prison to this day. He's since requested a new trial. He's since requested a bunch of things. Of there's a lot of stuff. We're not going to get to all of the things about Nicholas today, but from last week to this week, as I have dived into this case, I did this whole segment about autism and how the spectrum and how autistic people are misunderstood. I mean, how my daughter was diagnosed and all of these things, but he is not as dumb as he looks. He clearly has the ability to communicate and he had formed these thoughts all on his own. This is one of the rare cases where I felt like they got the, the, the case right in every regard. 10 years for Gypsy is fair. Yes. She rehabilitated herself very nicely after prison, or while she was in prison. She, I mean, she's married for God's sakes. Uh, Nicholas, life in prison, I mean, if you have the physical capacity, the mental capacity to carry out a physical crime like that, perhaps you belong in prison for the rest of your life. I don't know. And it's not the result of like you're defending like a, a loved one or something like that. I don't yeah. know. I could see myself doing something like that if it was like, hey, somebody hurt my daughter or like did something terrible to my daughter. I could see losing my mind in that regard. But in the name of love, no, of like, <laughs> give me a break. Oh, I, no, no, it's there was no excuse. <laughs> so, what do you think? Dynamic Gypsy versus Nicholas. How much blame do you attribute to Gypsy? Versus how much you attribute to Nicholas. Do I need to talk about percentages? <laughs> you don't have to talk about. You don't have to talk about shit. You could say whatever was in your heart. <laughs> Just like, what do you think about Gypsy? What do you think about Nicholas in this case? Do you have sympathy for both? Do you have sympathy for one and not the other? What are your thoughts? I, I think I do have sympathy for both. Like I mentioned in the beginning, I think this was just a relationship that kind of fed each other the wrong way. Yeah. And yes, she was, she's to blame on some things, but I, she was in this bubble. Like she just didn't know anything better. She was naive. She was not mature. She wanted to get out. I don't blame her for what she did. Cause in that moment, I think in her mind, that was the only way out. Yeah. And for him, I think he just found somebody to be able to, like, 
live his fantasy. And yeah. because either, I, I mean, I'm not going to, don't, I don't know enough about autism or anything like that, but I think his evil, I guess. Victor. Yes. Part Victor or whatever made him think that he had this evil vampire inside of him or double personality. Cause I, I mean, it, we haven't talked about if he has any other diagnosis. Schizophrenia, I yes. think, was was one that was proposed. Yes, things like something that. like that. So in that regard, I don't blame him too much because, I mean, I th at the end of the day, I think he's more guilty than her. I think he had oh, maybe more definitely. Uh, opportunity to stop like everything, but... Both of them, I think they had their excuses too as to why they ended up where they ended up. Like, it's. I'll tell you what, with there's there, there's only been there there hasn't been very many documented clinical diagnoses of multiple personality disorder. There was one on a Netflix documentary that I watched a few years ago, a couple of years ago. When I was in Big Bear with my wife, where this guy had like 17 personalities and he was speaking like different languages and it was legitimate. But then it turns out, oh, that was just gibberish. And it was actually, he, he was making it all up. It was like, the, but he had like severe trauma and all of these things. But the fact that there was 17 different people legitimately living in him was not really a thing. It was conjured in the traumatized brain of this individual. I don't know anything about his history, how he grew up, and I'll reserve judgment on it. But I think, that, I just think they got it right. I think they got it right. As far as Gypsy, she is married. She had been dating all along. She's had a very vibrant dating history in prison. She had a fiance and she got dumped by that fiance. And she met this new guy and this new guy. And we talked about him. I have the red flags all abound, all around regarding him. I would have wished she's been out since December 20th, about a month and a half now. I would have wished that she would have just experienced life by herself in the, the, the company of loving and caring people that are truly have her best interest at heart, as opposed to, oh, now I'm going to be married to this guy that has con demands of his own and he wants her, he wants to have kids with her and all of this stuff. And that is so well advised. I, they, they had talked about on that documentary about them getting the marriage annulled. annulled. They didn't. They, they're still married as, as far as I know to this day. So who knows what it'll be with that. But Are they still together though? As far as I'm aware, I haven't heard any updates on that. There was some false reporting that they did get the marriage annulled or Gypsy wanted out of the marriage. It was emails that she had sent to family members, but she kind of quashed that. They are together and living however they're living. Good luck to them, man. But I just wish she didn't do that because she's got so much growing and, and, and uh, maturing to do. She, she needs to learn how to live free. She spent all of her life confined to something. Yeah. Didi. Didi and then prison. Nicholas. Prison. And now this new husband of hers. And so that wraps up our coverage of the Gypsy Rose case. We may or may not do a follow-up episode on what's going on with Nicholas. If there's anything startling that comes out, we may cover it. You guys let me know what you want us to cover. But I think that for the time being, I think we're going to be moving on per your vote to whether or not a or Nicholas, Nicole Kessinger is an accomplice in the murder of the Christopher Watts case in the murder of his wife and his two uh, baby daughters, um, an unborn child, Nico. That's on the horizon. Um, there's other cases, but I think that we're, we're probably primed to do that one next. And if you guys have other requests, desires, maybe I'll put up another poll, but it looks like right now we're doing the Nicole Kessinger thing. Um, that's going to be a crazy one. <laughs> I've been hesitating to do that case for a long time, but I think now is the time we're going to hit that one. But before we do that, I think, Ileana, mm -hmm. it is time to bring in Purple Rain. 
Okay. Let us let us change the lighting. There we go. Because it is time for our brand new segment. Dominic titled it something Uncle Omar. Uncle. But I think what we're going to call it now from now on, you guys can let me know in the comments, is Family Law After Dark with Uncle Omar and Auntie Ileana, where we dissect us as family law attorneys, your questions about love and divorce, and give you our thoughts from a legal perspective. But here we go. I have a couple of cases on deck. I have exactly two, as a matter of fact. This first one, this person writes, so we're preparing to talk to our daughters. The situation is this. We got married. My wife is gay. She's come to that realization. We're getting a divorce. I want some advice on talking to the kids about what we should tell them. All right. He says, we're preparing to talk to our daughters soon. And really kind of need help on the why of it all. My wife and I are each other's favorite people. And the family we built together allowed her to finally feel comfortable enough about herself to realize that she is in fact gay it's amicable i'm genuinely happy that she's going to be able to live her her life as her true self but we have no idea how to broach any of that with our six-year-old she's incredibly accepting truly believes people should be love who they want like my best answer currently would be uh, some people like boys some people like girls some people like both Mommy thought she was a person who liked both, but has realized she can really only like girls that way, so we can't be together. It's not anyone's fault. We were just born this way, and it took until now to realize it. Is that an acceptable answer? It's all super difficult because neither of us actually wants to get divorced, but we also weren't compatible romantically. I'm not a woman. And while she is bisexual, she is fully homoromantic. What does that mean? No idea. And the nuance of any of that gets lost of grown adults, let alone a six-year-old. Hey, Dominic, what is homoromantic? Uh, no idea. Well, that's not helpful. I'm thinking that I'm like at the mental level, like the romantic part, it's she oh. likes more girls. Homo romantic means romantic attraction towards persons of the same gender. Yes. By romantic, romantic attraction towards two genders. Isn't that just gay? Isn't that just homosexual? I don't no, understand. No, but I guess you can have a sexual attraction and a mental or emotional attraction. So they're separating them. She is probably sexually attracted to men. But romantically, but romantically attracted. attractive to women. Eliana, help me. What's the difference? <laughs> what is there is you can have sex and not have any type of like romantic. Okay. I'll go with connection. it. Connection. <laughs> I'll go with it. But then when you go into a relationship, she probably realizes that she's more compatible with women. She prefers sex with men, but she wants to be romantic with women. Yes. I've never heard of that before. I um, have. Not with that term, homo, what, what was it? Homo romantic. Yes. But yes, I. All right. So let's, let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. What are your thoughts? How would you approach this with a, with a six-year-old? I will probably just reach out to the professionals, like to a therapist, psychologist that probably have dealt with this type of. I guess, transition and ask for some help. And at the same time, just, I mean, not answering your question, but as a comment, I think this person is putting too much adult thoughts and anal analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And children, especially six-year-olds, they don't go that deep. 
like he said, like I really them, don't. They're they're so simple. So I don't think that girl is gonna have that many questions as he has. <laughs> Here's what I would say. And this is a fantastic opportunity. Congratulations to you two. You've recognized that, hey, this marriage for what we signed up for, it's not going to work out. You guys are both in, an, in a happy place, amicable split. It's wonderful. That's wonderful. You still got a co-parent, though. You guys are still teammates. And you are going to have to figure out custody and visitation what does that look like because somebody's got to live the kid's got to live somewhere does he live with dad does he live with mom what is the status quo what have you guys been going through and the child's questions are going to stem with why are we living separately now why am i spending more time with mom or dad or why is things different i just want you guys to live together and she's lived her entire life as you know mom and dad are a romantic thing and now we're going to try to introduce homo I'm, well i'm homo romantic and so i i had sex with your dad to have mm -hmm. conceive you but i'm romantic with these other folks uh, with with these other females um there's no reason <laughs> I, if, if i'm having trouble wrapping my mind around it maybe it's easier for six reels because they have no point of reference mm -hmm. but there's no reason why that needs to be introduced at all but i what i think is this is a perfect opportunity now listen you guys are getting divorced you have to get these orders in place and you have to reconcile with her, number one, all right, this is happening. We don't have to fight about this. What does custody and visitation look like? Obviously, joint legal custody, joint physical custody. You're going to share in the raising and the rearing of this child. In what school district should the child attend school? Who is going to be the primary parent for purposes of choosing the school district? And, and again, visitation. If you guys had come to an agreement on that, you're so far ahead of the curve and good for you. And lucky. <laughs> and extremely lucky. Most people have to make these decisions where they hate each other's guts. He cheated on me or she doesn't love me anymore. This and that, whatever. A domestic violence, abuse, stuff. And, and it gets messy. So you have an opportunity to, to craft a arrangement that allows for the best interest of this six-year-old to have in, in, in that, this child's life, both parents equally and continuous on a constant basis on a 50-50, which is what the law presumes. So square that away first. Figure out what the living arrangements are going to be. Because if you guys tell your child that, hey, we're together, but we're not together, but we're still living together. Come on, man. That's going to be confusing for anybody. Yes. Let alone a six-year-old. You don't even have to go there yet. But really, when somebody moves out, we got to explain that. It's like, okay, hey, mom's still your mom, but she just lives over here now. Dad is, I'm still your dad. You live with me now, or you live with mom now, or however that arrangement is going to be. As to what to say, you don't have to talk about your wife's sexual proclivities. No. <laughs> you don't. Your, your child does not care. As, as she asks questions, you guys should find ways to answer that together. But if you guys are misaligned on that, or if you're unequally yoked on how we're going to describe, if mom says, for example, oh, I still love your dad and we're still, you know, your mom and dad, but I'm just living over here because I have things to do. But, you know, you're going to live with your dad and or whatever, however they're going to work that out. Fine. But then if you turn around and you say, oh, your mom's clearly a lesbian and so and homo romantic, your kid's going to be like, what? They don't need to be burdened with such things. You were confused earlier. Imagine a six-year-old. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's nothing wrong with your wife's lifestyle. You guys have both reconciled that. And that is a beautiful and wonderful thing. My advice to you would be basically this. Let the questions arise organically. There are lots of children that grow up in homes that are split. There are lots of children that are paraded back and forth between mother and father by virtue of some kind of agreement that they came up with or something that the family courts came up with or something that the attorneys came up with. Kids are resilient. You just have to make sure that they know, the child, that they know that it's safe. Perfect example. When my daughter, Raven, 
I was like five or six years old. She was fascinated by tornadoes, fascinated by natural disasters. What bad things happen when there's an earthquake? Hey, Dad, what bad things happens during a tornado? Hey, Dad, what bad things could happen if you're struck by lightning? And then I would tell her, said, well, if you're struck by lightning, you could die. I could die? Yes. But, but you are safe in this house. Or what bad things happens with a tornado? Well, it's this destructive twirly force that the wind comes and it takes and it rips apart properties. But we live in California and those aren't so prevalent here. And you have a home and it keeps you safe and you're going to be fine. What bad things happens during an earthquake? Well, the ground shifts and it moves and the, the forces of the tectonic plates shift in Hundreds of thousands of tons of millions of tons of pressure shift and it creates this shake that uh, moves the earth. And it's really scary when it's happening, but you're going to be safe. This is an opportunity. It's like, hey, we're going to live separately, but hey, your mom still loves you. Your dad still loves you. We're still your parents. And you could call your mom whenever you want. And you could call your dad whenever you want. And we will be here to protect and to nurture and so long as the child knows that, so long as the child is aware that they're going to be safe, whatever is coming next is going to be okay. And this child could grow up so well adjusted to the realities of uh, people having a different gender preferences and different sexuality preferences, and they could grow up to be very well adjusted and, you know, whatever. But one thing that they won't have to worry about is whether or not mom and dad love them. And that's a very wonderful thing that you could give gifts to a child. It's a big, scary world out there. There's lots of monsters and demons and snakes, but you're going to be safe no matter if you're with mom or with your, whether you're with dad and we're still friends and we don't have this romantic like relationship, but they're not even going to ask you about that until like, you know, I don't know. Maybe they, they, uh, ask, they, they watch Cinderella. Hey mom, who's your Prince Charming? Or Hey dad, who is your princess? Maybe they ask you questions like that. You answer them. So oh, my princess, is, is, is my princess my mom? No, because your mom has her own princess, but she's still your mom. And then her reality, her introduction into all of those things will just be a little bit different. It doesn't have to be dangerous. It doesn't have to be sketchy. Just ease your child into it. Be their protector. Be their nurturer. What you guys have begun is the beginning of a very beautiful co-parenting relationship. So long as you don't have material differences of how to raise a child, that should, there's no reason why they can't be maintained for the duration of your child's childhood. So those are my thoughts on it. There's no reason to just drop the full nuclear no. bomb on it. <laughs> why would you do that? Introduce it in bits and pieces. And as your child becomes more curious, they will answer or you will answer their organic questions and in that space, in that time, they're ready to receive the information. You will give them the answers. And I feel like you guys will live happily ever after on the strength of that. What do you think about that, Eliana? Happily ever after, separately. <laughs> happily, happily ever after as separate, separate people. Dominic, what are your thoughts? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Last week when you were gone, I was like, hey, Eliana, so what do you think about that? It's like, yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> um, I kid around. Okay, let's get on to the, the next case. Um, this next case is a little more complex. This person is looking for advice uh, that resulted in my friend divorcing his wife. Okay. So the advice is for the friend or the advice is for her? Because of her friend divorcing. I guess it's for his friend that is getting the divorce. I don't know. Let's, uh, let's, let's dive in. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so last October, a guy, and for all I know, this could be somebody, hey, I have a friend, but he's speaking for himself. Yes. So I'm just going to, I'm going to be advising mm -hmm. the husband in this case. So... A guy showed up at my friend's house claiming he was the father of my friend's eight-year-old and that 
He has friend. He got his wife's friend pregnant in an affair, but ran off and broke contact. Hell broke loose on the guy first, but seeing how the wife was acting suspicious, he confronted her where she admitted to cheating, but claimed the child was my friend's. So right off the bat, very easy solution. Go get a paternity test. Those things are very easily ordered by most family courts. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure every family court in the nation uh, would order such a thing. In California, you would file a paternity petition and request a, a DNA test, and the te- the, it would be ordered, and you would go through the protocols, and you would know with 99.99% certainty who that child belonged to. Most Labs now, like lab corp quests, they do them and they're pretty easy to get. Yeah, you might even be able to buy them at CVS for all, nowadays well, the, for all I know. The ones from CVS, I guess they're not as accurate. But what a lot of people do is they get the ones from the pharmacy to kind of get an idea. And if it results come out pretty high, then they get the the one from the lab, which is more uh, accurate to kind of like confirm things. Oh, I mean, in, in, in a litigation setting, you always want to get the... Of course. The lab ones, because they're the professionals. Leave it up to them. That's going to hold up in court. You you never know with these home taste, home tests how they could become contaminated or whatnot. Mm-hmm. So exactly. anyway, so friend, hey, touche. Friend got a paternity test done. There you go. <laughs> found out he is not the father. He was hurt and depressed. He left his house and stayed at a room away to think about the situation. His wife reached out to all of our common friends and they all asked him to forgive his wife and move on. Friend was feeling complicated. His thoughts kept revolving around the eight-year-old. The divorce law in my area says that infidelity is grounds for divorce, but it is the father's responsibility to make sure his kids are secure financially. But if the father can prove that the wife committed paternity fraud, he gets out easy. Any lawyer could take this case and win. Maybe. In California, it's a little more complex than that. If you sign the birth certificate and we don't know who the real father is, and we don't know have a person to take the place of the father, even if it's been proven that you've been scientifically deemed not the father of the child, you are still responsible financially for that child basically is a putative parent there's a difference between being the biological father and being the legal father Mm -hmm. and if you're the legal father even if you're not the biological you're still financially responsible yes ma'am super lawyer Ileana colon rosa (laughs) (laughs) that's 100 percent right it doesn't it it, it, you know it sucks but you could be proven to be not the father of a child that you've cared for, and now you're financially responsible. Hey, mm-hmm. but because it's in the best interest of the child to have somebody that we know is financially responsible, you were at the very least once, if not a biological father, a putative father, somebody that held himself out to be his father to the entire universe. Now um, you told everyone you were his dad. You signed his, his his birth certificate. You did all of these other things. You're his dad, so therefore you're financially responsible. But the DNA says I don't care. Bring me the dad and we'll make him a financial responsible then. If you don't know who that is, well, lots of luck to you. And it's sad because I get so many calls from these men that they're like, well, I had a hunch that this might not be my kid Mm -hmm. when he was little. I didn't do anything about it. And now, like, I mean, they got married, They, whatever. They're the legal father. And then many years after, they're like, we're divorcing, and now I want to do a DNA test. And it's like, it's late. It's yeah. A too late. It's a little late for that. You should have done it when you had that hunch. There's usually like a a, a, a forgiveness period of like the first year of life. Two you know? years? Yeah, first couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but short of that, if your name's on the birth certificate, you signed it. And, and you um, have the, they... two, the two years to revoke the voluntary B. Challenge it, basically, yeah, without penalty. It. And I think also you have like two years once you learn or you have that hunch, like, but if you don't do anything about it and you wait until you have to divorce, you're screwed. Yeah. You're going to be, you're going to have to pay child support for that child. It's, it, it, is it unfair? Yeah. It is unfair, but it is it but is financially unfair. But when it comes to what the, I guess the law is looking at is the best interest, best interest of the child. Of which the child. Is, 
And in that regard, that's how they justify this mm-hmm. very unfair financial circumstance for the guy that's not the dad. Yeah, I, I can't tell you that it's fair. It's not meant to be fair. It's meant to protect the children. Exactly. And the law is willing to do things that are not fair to the parties for the sake of the betterment of the child. That's the justification behind it. And so, yeah, it sucks. But let's continue. It is very different. Apparently where they are. <laughs> this guy is misguided in thinking that he, a lawyer could easily take his case and win. Anybody could take any, any knucklehead. Could, he could do it himself. Yeah. Hey, look, here's a paternity. I'm not the dad. So what? I don't have any idea what state this guy's in. But if he's in California, the judge would be like, oh, well, that's nice. You're still paying child support, buddy. Did you sign the birth certificate? Well, you had your two-year forgiveness period. You're going to be paying the bill. Sorry, man. If you find out who the biological father is, bring him in and we'll make him responsible. Mm -hmm. But until then, until then. All right. So due to his conflicting feelings, he had a massive breakdown. The wife and child also showed up to his place and caused a scene, asking for forgiveness and for daddy to come back. Could you imagine... Shout through that, like, why? Is she... <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> I can okay. You have a child right now. Imagine this child is five, and just imagine that all of a sudden, in some glitch of the universe, hey, you're not actually the mom, it was this other person, it was the ma- a glitch in the matrix. But you spent five years rearing this child, and now you're just they're telling you, Eliana, hey, move on, but you're gonna pay the bill though. How would you feel about that? It's a very emotional thing it to go through. It would be devastating. Devastating. Men do this all the time. But women who give birth to the child are not having to face this. Men is usually the only person that we're questioning the paternity about. But imagine, just you're the mother and, oh, but this it's not your child. But you positioned yourself as a mom. How would that affect you? Cycle? How could you even reconcile that to your own inward, to, to your spirits that I'm a I'm mom and now I'm not the mom? It's like, what? It's like a, the only way that I can think about it is as if your child just died because it's like you're losing it. It's not yours. I mean, not like possession wise yours, but it's like, I don't know. It, it must be be very very like you said devastating sad and i've seen a lot of dads like go into alcoholism and drugs yeah. just because of that because on account of that sometimes having a child it's their dream and it's crushed when they get the news that this is not your child 100 percent, and it's like from a male perspective mm-hmm. so we would take the child in we, we raise it, we're, we're there, we're all in, we're protecting all of our resources to the child, and then, oh, it's not yours. In the animal kingdom, if you ever watching the David Attenborough, that guy. I have no idea. He's the English guy that does all the animal videos. Dominic, am I getting his name right? David Attenborough, is that his name? My wife watches him all the time. He's like 90-something years old now, but he's been making like animal documentaries, and he talks about and. The lioness protects its cubs, but here comes the uh, wayward male that wants to be the alpha male. And the only way to win the affections of the lioness is to murder all of the babies that were from the other male. And that's what they do in the animal kingdom. Mm-hmm. So now the male, us, the man, is now knowing that the child ain't yours. But you accept it as your own, psychologically accept it as your own. And this, I mean, thrown for... In this case, the, the, the child is eight years old. So we're already doing like baseball practice. And, you know, I would be absolutely floored and devastated. Like a child died of mine. I don't know if I would have the strength to turn my back on that child on the and basis of ego. That's what I've seen. Yeah. Where people find out that they're not the father, but they do still continue the relationship because they take that role like a stepfather maybe would do if they raise a child since they're little. Yeah. That although this is not my blood, I consider them my child. Mm-hmm. 
But it, it is. I mean, it is still devastating. It happens, but it happens in relationships mostly where the the families is together. <laughs> Step parent comes in. My wife has done this. She's been a mom to my eldest daughter for since she was like nine years old, <laughs> and that's a difficult role to pull in. But yes. hey, it's like it's why I say you want to jump back in the market. You got kids. You want to get divorced. Okay, fine. What you're going to find Prince Charming now? Well, hey, now you're like single mom with like three kids. Good luck with that. I told my my, my wife, hey, if I met you and you had these two little shits right here, the, my kids, <laughs> if I met you and you had these two kids in tow, I would say, hey, that's nice. And then we would have probably had like fun for like a week or two. And then would have been, good luck with that. <laughs> That's so cruel. <laughs> it's, uh, if I was a single man and I didn't have that baggage, and I ha I had baggage, but mm -hmm. in my case, my wife came in and I was the one that had, mm -hmm. you know, the child, and so, yes. and so it's hard. And, and in your yes. case, you're dealing with that. Exactly, this, I dealt with the same. <laughs> but you take it in, and you're basically adopting that child, mm -hmm. and, and you make them their own, and you, you do all of that, and you accept all of those things. But it's this, it's, it's this dynamic that exists, and in this case, this this man is learning this eight year old is not his child devastating devastating but the law says oh no 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 and that's nice and all but hey you still owe all this money and uh, it's a cruel it is a it is cruel, cruel world that exists and this is really unique for men because there's not really many circumstances of uh, mistaken paternity with respect to the mom it's always of the dad of course. For obvious biological reasons. Yes. <laughs> no. That reminds me that every time I'm in court and they're doing the paternity finding and the judge asks, and are you the mom? I'm always like, really? Like, is this <laughs> is this question really yeah. necessary? Yeah, it <laughs> is. We it just got to make the finding. <laughs> yes. You know better, counselor. <laughs> okay. Yes. Let, it, let us continue. So he has a breakdown. A wife and child uh, shows up to his place. They cause a scene asking for forgiveness. Daddy, come back. Oh, that's so heart-wrenching. the child as a Manipulation. tool. Manipulation. Mm -hmm. So I usually stayed and listened to what he was feeling and saying, not giving any of my input until after the last time wife and child showed up. He said he wanted to know what to do. I tried to avoid adding my answer in any way and said there are no right answers and that he should do what makes him happy and mentally healthy. He kept on pressuring me for a more direct answer. And well, seeing how desperate he was for an answer, I told him that I would leave my wife in such a case without regret. She can manage her child. Her own. Okay. So what they're basically asking is, should I get a divorce or not? Yeah. Uh, so mid July, my friend finally divorced his wife and she moved out. He made a Facebook post thanking me for forgiving him advice uh, or forgiving him advice that made him resolve to leave fake happiness for his own selfish happiness. The ex-wife called me a monster for destroying their happiness. Most of our <laughs> friends and my wife are livid because they said I broke up their marriage. Wife is angry because my advice caused him to abandon his, not his, child, but that the child has lost the person they knew as their father. I am pretty sure I was clear about what I said. Okay, I get it. Here are my thoughts. Well, I'll let you share your thoughts first, Eliana. Well, talk about not, t not taking responsibility <laughs> for their actions, blaming the mom. Yes. <laughs> but it's pretty common when people are accused of infidelity, they immediately turn under the defensive and try to flip it onto the parent. It happens 100 times out of 100. It's one of the hallmark signs of infidelity. You suspect your partner of infidelity, and all of a sudden they start pinning it on you. 100% they're guilty of infidelity. And, and so. I guess said that on my way here to one of my clients in a very Puerto Rican say <laughs> uh, that uh, let me see if I can translate it the um, the stealer I guess or the robber judges by his own doing I guess the thief uh, judges by his own actions. Yes, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So whenever there's somebody that accuses you, oh, yeah, you're cheating, most likely that person. He is, is prosecuting himself. Yes. Yes. Not the allegations, you el, know. El ladrón juzga por su condición. That's the saying. Oh, it sounds much nicer in Spanish. <laughs> but look, man, should he stay? If I were a man, I would not. Hey, 
it doesn't say on here how much, how long they've been married, mm-hmm. but hey, you got a chance to get out now. Get out now. That's not even your kid. She was the one that decided to go out and, you know, do this. And it sucks that the kid is going to be caught in the crossfire, but there's nobody that said that you couldn't maintain a relationship with the kid. Obviously, it's not going to be very easy if you're not together with the mom. But hey, if the kid is calling you on the cell phone, asking for family advice, nobody said you had to, you know, ignore the phone call. Exactly. You can still be a mentor and all of those things. They don't mention it there, but they don't talk about any other kids. I think maybe if they had other kids, it's different. For him, it would have been different. But if it's just that one, like the friend said, do whatever makes you happy. You're asking, the yeah. The the your your the wife is asking you to forgive a transgression from eight years ago, but the eight the transgression lives with you on the daily. And you're raising somebody else's child. You are working hard to raise somebody else's child. It's a little difficult for of a pill to swallow for a man in that case. And if he has the opportunity, what's the cost to him? All right, well, alimony. How long have they been married? Less than 10 years? All right, let's just say half the term of the marriage. Let's just assume it was like a borderline 10-year marriage. Pay her alimony for five years. But, you know, child support, she's going to get you for child support, dude. You are 100% going to be on the hook. Your name is on the birth certificate, and you're not going to be able to place another person who would have been the prospective father. And if you find that person, good luck. You know, getting him involved in the litigation, there's cases where that happens, but it's very, it's really uncommon. He will have to agree to adopt the child. I don't even know this whole much. story about this guy knows the guy that did the thing. And, you know, I don't even know if they have any... Like, clear idea it could have been somebody else we have no idea who the paternity is Mm -hmm. she might have been in her mid-20s in her i don't want to use the word her hoe days you know when she was experienced hey men have those times exploring days her exploring days let's use that word (laughs) men explore america women explore america it's a thing you know i don't judge either sex or gender or whatever but she was maybe it was in those days and she just had no idea (laughs) But he's on the birth certificate, so he's going to be paying her birth certificate. Uh, her, he's going to be paying her child support. Maybe alimony. We're going to divide up the assets. Okay, so what are we going to do with the house? The house that everybody was living in? If you guys don't want to agree to let her live in and you buy her out, all right? Well, then we're selling the property, and it's going to be split amongst the sale. Now, your cars, you know, we're going to, the whole thing. Divorce sucks. It is a lot more involved. Than, you, you don't just get to break up and then move on. And so, but if you're going to do it, now was the time. Don't wait, you know, another 10, 12, 13 years, 15 years, and you're going to wake up and you're like 45 years old and you're still in the same situation and it's unhappy. There's a whole other dynamic to this. Okay, for this entire eight years, he's been looking at her as the mother of his child. Oh, she is not that. Now she is this charlatan. She is this harlot that had this 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 unadvised affair prior to them getting married or whenever it happened she has a child by the hand of another man that he's been raising and now he knows that he's never going to look at her the same he's never going to respect her the same he's never going to feel about her the same as he did prior to him finding out that information and so if he wants to say okay look Now, try to do the same thing you've been doing for the last eight years, knowing what you know now. Oh, it's not going to happen that (laughs) way. It is not going down that way. You guys are doomed to failure. If you weren't doomed to failure by virtue of her having a child at the hand of another man, now you know that. And it is even more doomed than it was before. There's virtually almost no prospect that I can foresee that you guys are just going to live happily ever after. Is it possible? Sure. Maybe you have more kids and you have your own, but you're, there's always going to be something in the back of your mind. You're never going to respect your partner the same. She's never going to be that princess that you thought she was. She's never going to be the, the Cinderella, the whatever, the Disney fairy tale. All of that is over. Now she's just a freaking bill with a kid that you're paying for that you didn't even make. And, you're never, ever, ever going to get over that. Could you forgive? Sure. Forget. Forgive her then. Now get over it. Well, I can't. But I thought you forgave her. Well, that's different. I know that. And so, good luck trying to move on with all of that. The marriage is doomed. 
The best case is divorce. If I were to advise him, I say, look, you might as well doing you might as well do it now while it is deemed a short term marriage, assuming this was less than 10 years, because if the date of marriage and the date of separation exceed 10 years, in the state of California at least, there is no legal authority of the judge to put an expiration date on alimony. That means you're going to be paying her spousal support from the date, well, forever, basically until she either remarries or she passes away. That sucks. And she may never decide to get married again because marriage sucks. Why would you do that? I'm going to get on my second one. And, you know, she's not going to go back to the guy she conceived with because that guy's probably long gone. He probably got a family of his own. He probably doesn't even know about the kid. And so this lady is left on her own. She's going to be dependent on you for the rest of your life. So get it done now if you're going to do it at all. Do not stay for the name of chivalry. It's not going to work out. So my advice for this man is cut your ties, get a divorce, move on. There's no reason why you have to completely communicate completely cut communication with a child. Um, but if he did, I would understand. Does that child have, to, yeah, it sucks for the child. He's going to have to deal with it. But that is the position that the mom put him in. So he's going to have to deal with it either way, whether they stay together or not. So I'll say this though. Children are resilient. Yes. <laughs> I don't even know if it's a boy or a girl, but in the mind of that young boy, he is a superhero. In the mind of that young girl, she is a mermaid with superpowers. They create their own narratives, and your story is the backdrop of their story, and they will write their story to their bidding, and they will do it in spite of your bad decisions or your indiscretions. So don't worry about them. They will be fine. Most children grow up in a broken childhood and no child grows up with a perfect childhood whatever discretions befall them they shall overcome and you have to trust that because it's what the universe demands and if they don't the universe will eat them up but that's life and we can't control it and it is what it is but that is the position that this young lady put her child in but he's gonna be fine oh yes and that's all I really have to say on the matter. And I think, Eliana, that that concludes our segment on Family Law After Dark with Uncle Omar and Auntie Eliana. I don't know if that's going to stick or not. I know. It sounds so weird. <laughs> but we'll see. Dominic will come up with something. With all of that, if you guys have been listening to this show for the last three hours, good for you. And thank you so much. for. I can't believe we've been talking for three hours, but we have. And my, my throat is not even tired. I, I, I credit the Templeton Rye. It's magical. Next week, we are going to get into the whether or not Nicole Kessinger shares some culpability in the murder of Christopher Watt's family, his wife and his two living children and the children that was in utero. The uh, Shanann Watts was pregnant with the baby. That's the story of a man that met some lady and he was infatuated with her and in and, and effort to basically move on from his family rather than just leaving and getting a divorce. He decided to, oh, I'll just murder my wife and murder my two children. I think they were like five and four at the time and move on. And I'll drop, I'll, I will drop them in an oil tank and, you know, nobody will know, be none the wiser. He was the stupidest criminal I've ever <laughs> seen. Jeez. Oh, I've been, I've been following that case since it happened in 2018, but we're going to talk all about it next week. And, but more importantly about his mistress, Nicole Kessinger, was she involved in the murders at all? There's been new evidence that's come out. New speculations that have come out. We'll get all into that uh, next week. But in the meantime, uh, for all of you out there, stay safe and love on your family. And um, join us next week as we continue. Oh, and by the way, congrats to our show as we have eclipsed 4,000 subscribers. 
Um, it wasn't just like maybe a couple of weeks ago I was telling, oh, hey, we got 2,000 subscribers. When I was up to four, we were well on our way to 10,000. And Eliana, you promised you were going to be dyeing your hair purple or, did we say purple or pink? Is one of the two. <laughs> Tell your husband, put him on notice. It's going down. I offer no apologies. Um, he, uh, uh, he, could, uh, he could blame the success of the show going forward, but it's happening. You told me I was going to sing a mariachi song. Yes. Hey, when I told that whole story, I wasn't saying that I was a good mariachi singer. Uh -huh. I just said it was a thing that I did. <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> it was a way that I got girls, or at least that I thought that that was how I was getting girls. But I was probably just making myself look like an idiot. Never mind. Those are the benchmarks. 10,000 subscribers. We're almost halfway there. And, um, well, will we get there by the end of February? Only time will tell. But let's see. We will see you guys next week. We love you all. And we will see you next week. Bye-bye.